Uh, hello, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I do hope that uh, you can hear me loud and clear. My name is uh, Barak Luka, and uh, I've got the privilege of uh, being the anchor person, the coordinator or moderator for that matter in uh, this uh, Zoom webinar session. I do want to apologize because we are starting a couple of minutes uh, later than had been anticipated. Uh, the practice has been to start uh, spot on time. And uh, I'm sorry on behalf of uh, all of us who are involved with the organizing and coordination. We had a small technical hiccup, but uh, it has been resolved. So once again, on behalf of the East African Law Society, and uh, the partners, I want to welcome all of us uh, on board. We are basically going to be reflecting about the state of uh, democracy in East Africa. And uh, we are using the end of the Cold War uh, as uh, the entry point. As uh, we know, it's usually very helpful in uh, discussions and conversations of this kind to have certain coordinates and uh, we have uh, chosen the Cold War, and uh, it's uh, coming to an end, as uh, we shall see presently, because uh, it was uh, a major landmark in the evolution of democracy, not just uh, in Af East Africa, but elsewhere in Africa, and indeed globally. That uh, it did uh, usher in new hopes, new opportunities, and 30 years later, we will be asking ourselves, uh, what is the state of the art? Have we gotten better? Have we gotten stuck in the same place? What are the hopes and what are the impediments? And uh, to help us to reflect on this uh, topic with participants right across uh, East Africa, Uganda, Tanzania, and Kenya, we have got uh, eminent uh, scholars in law and uh, in uh, history, in other areas of uh, human rights uh, concern and democracy. And we are privileged to be led by none other than uh, Dr. William Nyoki Mutunga. Dr. Mutunga has uh, joined uh, in, although I cannot see his image, we'll ask her uh, the CJ Emeritus, if you could uh, please click on the camera on uh, your screen so that uh, we are able to see you. The participants would like uh, to, 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 to not just to listen to you, but also to see you. So if you could yeah, kindly but, click. Muluka, I'm not a robot, so I'm just hiding. <laughs> oh, you're just hiding. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> we, we are going to unveil you at the right time. Okay, Jerry. that that is uh, fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, but welcome. I'm uh, uh, glad and relieved to hear your voice uh, at the right. other end. Yes, and uh, uh, we will also have uh, a number of uh, other persons, but uh, allow me to uh, finish uh, introducing Dr. William Tunga, as we are aware. He has been uh, the Chief Justice of uh, the Republic of, of uh, Kenya, the first uh, Chief Justice to be competitively sourced from a wide array of towering figures and uh, who had a very sterling uh, tour of duty as a CJ and as the president of the Supreme Court of uh, Kenya. He has taught uh, in the faculty of uh, law and uh, the University of Nairobi. And he has uh, qualifications in law from uh, Dar es Salaam and uh, from the United States of America. Uh, once again, Dr. Mtunga, uh, welcome on board. Uh, just uh, following the order of the images uh, as I see them on the screen, I'm uh, pleased to introduce uh, Maurice uh, Makolo. Maurice uh, Makolo is the director of Ford Foundation. 
in uh, charge of uh, the Eastern Africa region, and he's based uh, in Nairobi. He has uh, been involved in many activities around uh, uh, human rights uh, and the law, around the improvement of uh, livelihoods, both for rural and uh, urban populations that are challenged for uh, livelihoods. He's been concerned with matters of uh, the environment, among many other concerns. And uh, uh, Maurice holds a Master of Laws degree and a Bachelor of Laws degree from the University of Nairobi. And so I'd like uh, once again to say Karibu Sana uh, Morris na kukaribisha kwa moyo mkunjufu. Asante sana na tumai unanikiza asante. Yes, uh, una unanipata kwa njia kamilifu Morris. Nimekupata na mimi pia natarajia kwamba mnanipata vizuri. Eh twakupata barabara. Karibu sana. Asante. Eh, uh, Omar uh, Said uh, Shaban uh, across the border in Tanzania is a managing partner and founder of uh, Said Attorney and Associates. And Mr. Said is experienced in investment laws, facilitation, civil and commercial litigation, and conveyancing law. And he serves as company secretary for a number of companies in Zanzibar and uh, Tanzania. He has done uh, lots of uh, good work again in uh, advocacy in the area of uh, human, human rights uh, in uh, Tanzania and uh, certainly one of the voices to look out for and to listen to on matters of uh, law. Uh, within East Africa. And uh, allow me now to bring on board uh, Jacqueline, Jacqueline Asimwe. Jacqueline Asimwe is also a towering figure in law and uh, who has been involved with uh, advocacy in uh, Uganda. Um, she holds, uh, of course, uh, qualifications in uh, law, and she's uh, an outstanding and very respected uh, legal uh, practitioner from the Republic of uh, Uganda, done a lot, again, with the challenged uh, communities, and urban environments, and rural environments, advocacy for inclusion of women, and uh, Jacqueline, welcome. Welcome, Nyebo. It's good to <laughs> see you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. Yes, welcome, I can, Nyebo. loud and clear. I apologize that uh, I initially got your name wrong. It is uh, Asimwe, and uh, I apologize because we did send out a circular that said Tumsime. Uh, I think it's because I was thinking about my friend James Tumsime who has been a publishing editor like myself. So welcome, Karib Sana Thank you. Thank you right, so much. I think, uh, very good. I've got um, about 42 participants uh, uh, so far, and uh, we will be ready to get started. I just need to remind us as we begin that uh, all opinions are valid and that uh, we are going to conduct uh, this webinar in a manner that uh, indicates that we are tolerant of divergent opinion. In any event, we are talking about uh, democracy, and democracy is about the possibility of allowing as many voices as possible to be heard, and they need not be agreeing we can disagree in a, a mature manner uh, so that we attack the ideas, we attack the issues, but we do not attack the people. We leave them with their dignity intact. 
So to get us uh, started, uh, we have got a, a brief 10 minute um, clip which has been prepared for us by one of uh, our leading journalists uh, in the region. We have been working with him in this series of uh, webinars. He's uh, Wanyama Wachibsiri, who has worked as a senior editor with the BBC, and uh, he is today a communications consultant. He's prepared for us the cut and riser. The sequence of the activities will be that after that, we will uh, bring on board uh, CJ Emeritus to give us uh, the keynote uh, uh, address in this matter. After we will then have the three interventions, we'll have a bit of a conversation around the main uh, speakers, the panelists, and I will then ask the technical team to open the plenary for the rest of us. Therefore, at this point, and trusting that uh, our rapporteur, Rose Lucalo, is on board. I haven't seen her, but I want to believe she's on board. I do now request the technical team to play the clip. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. U.S. President Ronald Reagan applauding Soviet Prime Minister Mikhail Gorbachev while celebrating the end of the Cold War, bringing to an end a nostalgic period of geopolitical tension between the Soviet Union and the United States of America and their respective allies. The end of this war of attrition in 1990 ushered in a new dawn around the world that witnessed free elections hosting communist regimes, especially in Eastern Europe. The Soviet Union collapsed and dissolved into its component republics after losing grip and influence in Eastern Europe. But what exactly was this Cold War that started in the aftermath of World War II in 1945? Dr. Thomas Otieno Juma is a university don and political analyst. This war envisaged a high pitch tension, political and military. It brought in what we would call polar altercations, what we call two major world powers getting involved and clashing with one another. The powers were the United States of America and her Western allies vis-a-vis -vis USSR and her sympathetic... USSR standing for? A Union of Socialist Soviet Republic. So another characterizing factor of the fought ideologically, democracy and communism. Another characteristic of this war, I must say conceptually, is that it was never hot uh, because the word which has been used repeatedly is that it is Cold War. By the way, why was it referred to as Cold War? What was the genesis of this uh, narrative Cold War? It was Cold War because uh, it was neither here nor there. But the effects were vividly felt. In other words, you would not see these powers basically facing each other and fighting each other. But they were fighting uh, through proxy. They were fighting through espionage. They were also fighting through propaganda. Another character of Cold War is that the competition included supporting major regional wars such as in Korea, Vietnam and Afghanistan, likewise in Africa. I should also mention something about the main protagonists in this war. The United States Western Alliance, NATO included, then the Pacific States, the Central Treaty Organization, this one comprises the Middle East uh, states that were sympathetic to America. Now this alliance versus the USSR, the Union of Soviet Socialist Soviet Republic uh, 
and allies, which included countries like Albania, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, those which were sympathetic to the communist, communist ideology. Now, it pitted the USA alliance in wider NATO sympathetic group versus the Soviet Union alliance in the Warsaw Pact. The United States of America and her Western associates allied to the political and military alliance known as North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, were engaged in a cutthroat rivalry with the Soviet Union and her Eastern Europe partners in the Cold War that polarized many nations around the world for more than 40 years. Throughout the Cold War, communist and capitalist nations tried to outdo each other, competing to develop the best technologies and weapons. Diana Necroponte, an American public policy analyst, argues that the tension between the superpowers are existing even after the end of the Cold War. The advent of Mr. Putin's expansionism and a Russia which states that it is humiliated by events of the end of the Cold War makes it relevant today. One of the fascinating aspects of history is the, the old, another conundrum about whether the person makes history or history makes the person. And I, I'm thinking you mentioned Mr. Gorbachev. And what are you finding about his role? Is, was he, is he, he, should he be looked at as, on as a hero or a victim of circumstances? It depends from where you're looking. For the West, Gorbachev is a hero. He is a man who understood that the old Stalinist system was dead and left Russian Soviet citizens poorer. But now, if you were to ask the Russian people what they think of Mikhail Gorbachev, their answer would be completely opposite. They see in him the man who led them into this period of economic turmoil and political weakness. Mm -hmm. so Many countries in Africa, such as Angola and Mozambique, became battlefields for major players during the Cold War who wanted to exercise their military prowess. Ambassador Frank Wisner from the U.S. State Department remembers this vividly. This struggle in Africa broke out after Vietnam. The United States was highly sensitive at the time to the fact that it had been driven from the field in Vietnam and that our opponents, uh, namely Moscow, would take advantage of this period of American weakness or the perception of American weakness to secure geopolitical gains elsewhere. If the MPLA achieved power with its strong connections to the Cubans and to the Russians, you would see the first serious physical penetration of the East Bloc into African affairs, and we regarded that as a strategic threat. We provided arms and financing to hire uh, mercenaries, provide trainers, provide weaponry uh, to El Roberto's uh, armed elements, and through Mobutu, that equipment and funding was put before the uh, FNLA. The socialist capitalist divide provided a fertile ground for misrule to thrive in the third world, although things changed after the collapse of the Soviet Union. There was a fresh hope for a new beginning, especially in Africa. And so, how is the situation in Africa 30 years after the end of the Cold War? In an interview with an American TV author and conflict resolution expert, Dr. Adekaye Adebajo, argued that all is not well on the continent. You have 16 landlocked countries in Africa now as a result of these political compromises of European imperial powers. And you have many states that are unviable also. They're not really able to be economically viable unless they're linked to larger structures, which is why regional integration is so important for Africa. The fact that there were political systems which did not in any way accord with how people were ruling themselves, and conflict resolution mechanisms that, for example, existed in traditional African structures were also destroyed. But I don't only place the blame on external actors. I also note that 
African actors in the 50 years after independence have not done much to reverse that blighted legacy, you know, with maybe a few exceptions, because one-party states and military rule were the norm in Africa, you know, between 1960 and 1990. No single party lost an election in Africa, no ruling party. Mm -hmm. And so it's important also to look at autocratic misrule and corruption and the lack of imagination and ingenuity in forming federations, trade blocks, etc. Even though the Cold War ended three decades ago, geopolitical tensions between Russia and the West still make headlines today. In Africa, and in particular Tanzania, the big question is, are there any lessons we can draw from the post-Cold War period as the country prepares for a general election later in the year? Uh, asante sana wanyama wa Chepsiri uh, for that uh, clip. I trust that uh, we are still airborne and that uh, we are still getting each other loud and clear. And we have seen a number of issues coming up. We have uh, heard of things like uh, misrule thrived during the Cold War. Has it uh, stopped thriving? Have we become any better? 30 years later, we have heard about our uh, a blighted uh, legacy. Are we correcting it? We've heard about uh, corruption. Are we getting anywhere near the hopes that uh, came with the collapse of the Iron Curtain in Eastern Europe? Allow me, ladies and gentlemen, to now invite uh, CJ Meritus, Dr. Willie Munyoki Mutunga, to give us uh, his keynote thoughts. Over to you. Oh, thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Muluka and the, the finalist, uh, panelists. I, I don't have a, a keynote uh, address as such, so I'm just going to be conversational and uh, deal with the topic that uh, you asked me to reflect on, which is uh, hopes and impediments in the new age of multi-party democracy. Let me just start by, um, you know, going a little bit uh, back than the 1990 and uh, talk about something that Isa Shivji discusses uh, very well in some paper he wrote called Village Democracy. Um, uh, because, you know, we, we, we've got to historicize and problematize this view that uh, uh, they want, you know, democracies or they want uh, leaderships, uh, you know, before, before uh, colonialism. The, the, the village democracy, if I might explain it, I can explain it from my own experience, which was the, the community I grew up in the 50s uh, in Kitui, you know, which is uh, the eastern province of, of, of Kenya. And uh, a lot of people of my generation will have this experience where uh, the, your community, uh, was maybe a, a thousand people, and there will be about five rich people. Uh, but the community coexisted. Uh, there were common watering areas. You know, the uh, the rich helped the poor. Uh, common grazing areas, and uh, growing up in that community, although it was under colonialism, uh, I felt that I was a child of the community. Uh, completely and uh, the elders met over various issues, you know, making decisions and so forth. If there were disputes, uh, they were sorted, sorted out, you know, uh, within the village, the village knew who are women and men of integrity who could sit and hear those disputes. I remember growing during that period 
the village had, on, had only two thieves than they were known. So uh, there's, so within the, what, that 1,000 people existing under colonialism, okay, uh, the communities uh, were, you know, it might be sound ironical, but they, they had that freedom to go around their uh, issues and the, their material needs and, and uh, exist. And the only time I got in, uh, in touch with the colonialism was through schools, you know, uh, and the churches and uh, where the British were in Kitui, you know, you know Kitui town. So the, 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 it's, it's good, to, it's important to know that uh, this notion of community democracy or village democracy has existed in parallel with the other democratic forms uh, that we have experienced. It wasn't just like our cultures. <laughs> they, they still resisted, they were not uh, liquidated. And uh, so, so that, that's what Shivji discusses. He basically says that is, that is the, uh, the something that has to be looked at uh, because it's existing and uh, we can, you know, borrow from that. But of course, uh, you know, within colonialism, uh, that system was also dominated because there were dual court systems or issues of uh, taxation, the education itself was, uh, uh, you know, fairly colonial. Uh, the, the religion said, you know, I'd, uh, you know, come in. But during that period, I think uh, there's consensus that you can't talk of uh, democracy and uh, colonial authoritarianism. Uh, when you trace the whole of East Africa, uh, you find how the colonial systems were set up in in Kenya, Uganda, and and Tanganyika. You know, after the, the Tanganyika after the first first World War, when it became a League of Nations, you know, uh, uh, trusteeship, and then it was a protectorate uh, run by the the British. You you look at the laws and everything else, whether it's land being taken, whether it's minerals and everything else, it was, uh, it was what lawyers actually call, you know, supreme theft. Because the British have a law that says that if you are not an owner, you cannot transfer a title. But they violated that completely by, in the case of Kenya, by just basically uh, taking land for free, using it for 68 years, and then we were foolish enough at, at independence to basically say, uh, we will buy, you buy it back, okay? What the Kenyans remember is the winning, we, willing seller, willing buyer. But the willing seller was a thief, okay? It's like somebody taking your jacket and they tell you, oh, Muluka, you know, have your counter suit, uh, but it will cost you if you want it back. Uh, so colonial authoritarianism, and uh, there, there is a lot of writing, whether by Yash Guy, the most recent one I've seen is uh, a manuscript by Tundu Lisu, which is brilliant on that history of colonial authoritarianism. The, the democracy, they start, uh, they, first of all, the Africans are represented by missionaries, particularly white people, and then they are nominated you know, and then after nominations, just before independence, that's when you have kind of multi racial representation in parliament. But the legi cause, the legi cause uh, were basically that, you know, uh, they were completely dominated uh, by the imperial system in, uh, you know, in, in Britain. Uh, and and that, 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 uh, that story, uh, is is told in many books. I can't uh, go go into it. Every country will know. If it's Uganda, uh, the who, the way the British through divide and rule uh, prioritize Buganda, 
you know, for example, and the kingdoms. And uh, at independence, they come up with what they call the federal and the unitary, uh, you know, uh, constitution, which, which is too, I think is too very uh, problematic. So the, of course, at independence, uh, you know, there we get into this area of constitutionalism, where Britain now is ready uh, to, to, as it were, uh, uh, you know, agree to independence. And the, in, in the three countries, there is a very interesting history of the L Lancaster conferences. Uh, Tanzania had theirs in, uh, in Dar es Salaam, uh, but the others were, in terms of Kenya, there were three of them uh, in, in Lancaster where these constitutions were, uh, were actually uh, negotiated. And that's when you get to uh, what we now call post-colonial authoritarianism. The colonial state state uh, was was not touched, and uh, uh, you had, if you take the case of Kenya, uh, the constitution was basically changed. Hello, and, uh, have I lost you? Have I lost you? Okay, I can hear you. Yeah, uh, carry on, uh, carry on. Yeah, yeah. So, so in the case of Kenya, we know, you know, how the constitution was very quickly changed, and there were amendments, and we had this. Um, what we came to call the imperial presidency uh, and uh, the one party dictatorship. And in, in Uganda and Tanzania, you, you get the same, there's that, that particular history. Uh, Tanzania starting with uh, arguing that, you know, one party is the best form of government to, to bring about uh, unity and uh, even in their, you know, independence cons uh, constitution, uh, uh, Tanzania uh, was able to, or Tanu for that matter, the party was able to convince the British that the, the constitution should not even have a Bill of Rights. Uh, and, and, and that happened. And it's, of course, it's, it came much, much later. That's when the constitution of, of Tanzania reflected uh, you know, you know, a bill of rights, but that is very also very very interesting history about uh, constitutions and how they were amended. In the case of Uganda, of course, everybody remembers the coup, uh, Obote's coup, and uh, where he drafted the constitution and went to parliament and they were told to pass it, and when they asked where the constitution, what the draft was, they were told it was in the pigeonholes. So they would, you know, they should pass it and then read it after. Uh, it's pretty hilarious, but it's it's it's, it's there. The uh, uh, the constitution making itself in East Africa, when you trace it, it's also very 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 interesting reading in terms of uh, presidential or this imperial presidency, uh, the uh, the oppression of parliament, the 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 uh, the judiciary and the institutions that are uh, destroyed because of, of of this one party dictatorship. Even the issues of electoral uh, justice were non-existent. The the one party system uh, they had these elections where you know you had to vote yes or no, and and if you if you go to the history of it. Uh, whether it's uh, in Egypt or East Africa or Central Africa, uh, the counting was very, very interesting because the dictators always got 99% of the votes, 98% of the votes. And I remember when we were I was studying in Dar es Salaam, we said they must have been counting, you know, where you voted yes, you know, they count that, and where you voted no, they would count that as well. Say you are actually saying no one else except the person who was on the ballot. And that's how the figures go to 99% or 99.1%. The history of these 
one-party dictatorships and the military dictatorships in Uganda is again a, a history of authoritarianism is an history where you can't really talk about democracy, whether you're talking about that village democracy or whether you're talking about the, the British one, the liberal uh, you know, democracy, where you, you talk of um, uh, separation of powers, checks and balances, free and fair elections and so forth. That wasn't uh, you know, the case. And uh, those discussions, of course, as we have seen from the clip, uh, happen, you know, during the Cold War. Um, and the, 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 the issue of the Cold War, uh, of course, the clip uh, doesn't even scratch the surface of, 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 of uh, this, uh, you know, particular uh, era where the uh, the world was multi, uh, multipolar, and uh, the 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 there's, there's a lot of discussion on what actually collapsed in uh, you know Soviet Union, whether it was socialism and, or communism, and uh, uh, Dan Nabdere from Uganda has written a lot on that issue. If people are interested in uh, you know reading. Uh, uh, that debate in 1986, he wrote a manuscript that hasn't been published, where he talked about uh, social imperialism. He was arguing that uh, there wasn't socialism in the Soviet Union. Actually, to, you know, they had managed to have within the party and uh, within the state uh, and within the bureaucracy a class that was. Uh, reflected all the values of, of uh, 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 you know, uh, bourgeois classes in, uh, in a capitalist uh, countries. And that debate continues with China now, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, the other African uh, intellectual who you will find very, very useful in dealing with this issue of the Cold War is Samir Amin, who died, I think, last year. He's written a lot of stuff uh, in trying to, 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 to look at the Cold War. He goes back to the Bandung era, the non-alignment -ali movements, uh, and so forth. And, and it's very, 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 uh, you know, interest, interesting reading for us to, uh, to look at as we go back to, to look at what in Kenya, we call it the second deliberation, all right? When we move, we, we get into another round of constitution making uh, because multi-parties are back uh, from, in our case, from uh, 1991. And in 1992, there was, there was uh, multi-party elections in Tanzania. You also have that. Um, and in Uganda, the 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 whole question of elections is after Museven comes into, uh, into power, whether uh, there was democracy there is something that I guess we can uh, uh, debate. What I see very clearly, um, you know, in, in East Africa is, is, is again uh, authoritarianism, uh, uh, although the constitutions try to move towards uh, liberal democracy and some elements of social democracy. Uh, but uh, you still had, and this is why uh, doing a class analysis of the issue is important. You still had uh, leaderships and the parties uh, that were still you know, dominant, whether it's the uh, CCM, NRM, or uh, Party Kanu, which, 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 which uh, we always call Baba na Mama, because the, the others just come, and they, they are, are actually siblings of uh, or the children of, of, uh, of, 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 uh, of Kanu. So, so the, when you look at what uh, 
we are discussing here yeah, hopes and impediments. Okay, if I deal with the impediments, for example, uh, having given that particular trajectory, we you can see very, very, very clearly that uh, the foreign interests, whether the colonial uh, power and uh, colonial interests have always been there, okay? You know, uh, for, for during the time of colonialism, uh, through Cold War and through the, you know, constitution making processes. And that has been, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the case. Uh, and in the case of Uganda, you know, we, we, we basically make this joke that there's somebody who, uh, one of the Ugandans decided to form a political party and the objective of that political party was uh, that he would want the British to come back uh, because they were better rulers and so forth. And he ended up getting only two votes. So when he asked his wife, uh, what exactly happened? The wife told him, you must be an idiot because the British never left. So those, those interests are still there. They are very, very important. The co connection between our political leadership and the foreign interests is something that uh, I, don't, uh, I don't have to spend most time talking about, about it because it's, 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 it's very clear how our uh, 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 Comprado uh, political leadership uh, has become a, um, an agent of uh, foreign interests from the West uh, and the East. Um, and the, the issue about democracy, the burning issue about democracy in East Africa now that we need to discuss in my view is the quest for alternative political leadership uh, because that's where uh, we, we, we just have to start. Whether it's in the case of Kenya where we say we have a progressive uh, constitution which is true, but who is implementing it? You know, uh, Muluka wrote a brilliant piece the other day basically saying don't, let's not change the constitution, change the leadership. Because if, if, if you, you don't change that leadership, uh, whether it's in Uganda or you know, Tanzania, even if you have a, a great constitution, uh, nothing will happen. The, 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 the oppression, the exploitation, uh, relationships with foreign uh, interests, uh, we, we need a political leadership that is not captured and enslaved and that uh, carries as we see uh, our leadership, uh, leadership do, uh, you, you know, stay in power on the basis of politics of division. There are, there are geniuses in doing that, you know, when it comes to ethnicity, when it comes to race, it comes to gender, it comes to generation, it comes to clan, you know, class, uh, everything. Even the Premier League is not part of that division in our own, uh, you know, uh, countries. So th this is, uh, without focusing on, on uh, you know, Tanzania and their problems with the uh, Mapadlocks, they, it's, it's the whole East African, you know, whole East African issue we have a political leadership that are not going to change anything. You know, they have shown during this uh, pandemic that they are incapable of actually dealing with uh, issues that affect us. Instead, in the case of Kenya, we are dealing with a situation where the uh, monies of COVID-19 have been stolen. So if you are going to, to be, uh, be talking about uh, uh, democracy and how uh, the, uh, we are going to have uh, electoral justice, how we are going to uh, deal with what Shivji calls commons and the public goods, education, uh, water, food, this stuff that we have been facing because of pandemic, all right? 
it, we, we, we cannot solve it unless we have a leadership that is not stealing our, our you know, our taxes and our resources. We have to have a leadership that looks into these commons and these public goods and, uh, and the democracy, the Kenyan constitution, for example, has very good provisions on how to organize politics. It has a chapter on uh, integrity, which if we implemented, of course, the whole lot of them will go home. They won't, they won't be ruling anymore uh, because uh, they lack you know, uh, integrity. So I place my hopes, my hopes, I uh, place my hopes on this alternative political leadership in East Africa that has a vision you know, that deals with uh, what I've seen as, uh, you know, the dominance of foreign interest in our countries, uh, that it deals with this issue of commons and public goods, and, you know, the, that deals with the unfulfilled promise uh, uh, of, of democracy, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, you know, in East Africa. So that's basically the trajectory, the notes ahead around which uh, we could have either questions and comments, uh, you know, my fellow panelists can, uh, can weigh in. Uh, but that is the historical ba background I wanted to give uh, from the village democracy to this uh, colonization, post-colonial, Cold War, constitutionalism and where we are at at the moment where Kenya has a very progressive constitution uh, Tanzania and Uganda are lagging behind uh, Tanzania almost made it if they uh, um, if they had legislated the the warioba draft although it had weaknesses but it would have been fairly uh, progressive. But what I'm saying is, uh, and I've used the metaphor of a constitution, a transformative constitution being a beautiful baby that is born, but what we do all the time is to hand it over to traffickers, child traffickers. How can it grow? How can it succeed? So you need an alternative political leadership, you know, to implement the constitution and uh, in uh, Kenya, what I hear young people saying now is, we don't want reforms, we want political power so that we can actually ref make the reforms ourselves because we know, you know how to do it. So hence what Muluka said, uh, which is trending all over the place, change leadership, not the constitution. Thank you, Wanda Muluka, I pause. Asante sana mwalimu kwa hayo maoni. Uh, I think uh, that uh, has been a, a stunning telescope of uh, this journey as uh, we have uh, walked it uh, this far, taking us right back to the village and uh, seeing how democracy functioned uh, in the village uh, at that time, we have had uh, in Kitui, in this uh, village, there were two thieves and they were known by name. Now we seem to have myriads of uh, thieves uh, everywhere. It does appear, in fact, that one of the benefits of going into government is the opportunity to steal. And if you're not able to do so, then uh, I think you have got to be shown the way out. We have also seen, and I appreciate that very much, that democracy is not necessarily just about uh, elections. It's much broader than that. It's in fact how we do everything. Uh, questions of where we are born pertain to democracy, the environments we are born in, the opportunities in those environments, participation in those opportunities pertains to democracy. And uh, I think uh, that's a, a very good place to now invite the other minds around the table. Malim, thank you once again. You said you did not have a, 
a keynote, a written keynote address, but uh, you had keynote thoughts. And those uh, keynote thoughts give us uh, a very good platform for further engagement. So let me uh, cross over to our good friend, uh, Omar Said uh, in uh, Tanzania. If you could please make a uh, uh, intervention on the basis of uh, what we have seen, what we have heard so far, as well as your own thought. Ndugu Omar Said Kwako. Thank you, Barak. I hope you, you hear me. I hope everybody can hear me. And Nakupata, Nakupata, I can hear you. More than clear. I can hear you. I can see you and I can hear you. Thank you. Proceed. Asante Sana. Um, first, uh, I thank East Africa Law Society uh, for inviting me to these sessions and uh, to share my thoughts uh, about the, the multi party democracy in our region. Uh, the hopes and impediment, and also I want to thank uh, Dr. Willy Mutunga, former Chief Justice of Kenya and the President of Supreme Court of Kenya, for insight uh, keynote or key thought, as, as you, you call it, uh, on the history and the where we are and the, the bigger picture of the, in the region. Uh, I, I, I want to subscribe to, 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 to his uh, uh, thoughts, uh, his, uh, his idea of what the situations, uh, where we are now, and in particular looking uh, lightly uh, on what's going on in Tanzania. And uh, I, I, I believe that, I, I, I believe that uh, the regions in East Africa has, has a common and a shared problems on, when it comes to democracy uh, and uh, the hopes, the level of hopes and the level of impediments uh, differ in one country, in one jurisdiction to another. And I will talk specifically on, uh, in, 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 in my jurisdictions in my country, Tanzania. Uh, we, for the last uh, five, six, seven years, we have been experiencing what, uh, what, what hasn't been uh, thought about Tanzania before uh, as, as, as a country which was uh, progressing towards democracy. But uh, the, there's been a high turn of events uh, where over the last five years we have seen every aspect of uh, constitutional rights and uh, <clears throat> human rights are tested by the authorities. And uh, there has been a wide spread concern by many actors. And these concerns attract not only actors in the country, but also actors in the region. Uh, things like uh, freedom of expressions, uh, freedom to of associations and participates in the politics, uh, the media freedoms have been tested in many times. Uh, this 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 actually uh, many many of us thought that uh, all this happens because of the of the of the constitutions. You know the constitutions we have. The constitutions is the ones said by Malim that we have a constitutions in the country which gives uh, dictatorial power to the president. You know, the Tanzanian constitutions as it reads as it is now, it gives a lot of powers to, to the president uh, who has a lot of powers. The, 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 actually the balance, uh, the, the checks and balance uh, uh, is not as it, Suppose, or oh, it, 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 one would have expected that it is. Uh, we have experienced that. Uh, uh, we have experienced that authorities, you know, taking their larger stake in the legislations. Uh, uh, we have experienced the authorities also. I mean, when I say authorities, I mean executive, taking their larger stake, their lion's shares in the judiciary as well. Uh, so this uh, take away that uh, concept and uh, 
uh, uh, that concept of uh, balance uh, or separation of power and checks and balance. Uh, we have a constitution, not a progressive, as uh, the constitution of uh, Kenya uh, or like other countries. I agree with the, with the, with the Dr. Willy Mutunga there that uh, the Kenyan constitution has been progressive. Uh, it uh, it, uh, it manages the power, the politics of the country. Uh, but uh, contrary to what we have now, you know, in Tanzania, as you all might be aware, that despite uh, the widespread concerns and the long time concerns about, uh, you know, the power of the court to, 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 to question or to look into presidential elections, you know, this, this, this is still uh, a restricted, this is still a taboo in our, in our Tanzanian constitutions. So you cannot uh, have a, a democracy in practice where the, 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 the president, uh, uh, presidential elections cannot be brought uh, under scrutiny and the inquiry of, 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 the, of the judiciary. Uh, there's no valid reasons, you know, to, to, time has gone now, time has come now to allow, to allow, to allow for, for judiciary uh, to, to have a, a place in the country's politics. But also, uh, uh, we have experience over the last uh, two years, how the elections is managed. Uh, we have experienced uh, that uh, the election rigging has taken a new form now. We are actually taken, uh, uh, the multi-party democracy is taken to monoparty democracy. And why I'm saying this? I'm saying this because we have experienced over the last two years that the electoral body uh, 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 ensuring that uh, the opposition candidates don't stand for elections. You know, we have cases, a lot of cases, and we have seen, you know, in Tanzania, we have uh, two elections. Uh, the one uh, uh, for local government and the one for parliamentary and the presidential elections. So in 2019, I think uh, most of you might have heard that we have election uh, for local government, you know, where we were, we were electing uh, our local leaders. And 85% of the opposition candidates were eliminated from the, or were disqualified. And uh, if you hear the grounds for disqualification, you would see that where the country, the country is going, you know, you, the, the, the candidates were, 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 were disqualified simply on the ground that uh, the name of the parties, uh, the name of the parties were misspelled. So the right to contest, the right to, uh, the right to be elected, to participate in country's governance is taken away simply because the nomination form has a typing error. Because if somebody wants to, if, if the party is known as a alliance for change and the transparency, and someone written and in a symbolic forms instead of a word forms, that right of participating in country's politics is taken away and you are disqualified. You know, these are the, some of the incidents that uh, bring a widespread concerns uh, among the actors here uh, as to whether where the country is leading. Are we going to, are we leading to mono, mono, uh, a single party or do we still want to retain uh, a multi-party? This 2020, October, Tanzania is uh, going uh, for general elections. We have seen that happens again. You know, we have a widespread concerns, uh, majority of opposition leader, and you can see the objections as to nomination was both uh, to opposition candidates and the ruling party candidates, but none of the <laughs> none of the of the ruling party candidates uh, the ruling uh, there is no ruling uh, uh, against the the non uh, the, the, the ruling party candidates were issued against them or in favor of oppositions. Uh, you know. 
the, the, the big concerns with many actors here, and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking uh, from the opposition concern, is that in 2015, the ruling party uh, initiated uh, the policy known as uh, Baolam Kono. I don't know how to, it's like a Maradona's style of winning a goal, you know, by hand. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I don't know those who are the football fans could remember how Maradona uh, scored a goal by using his hand. So this Baolam Kono comes in a different forms now. That's what we see. It comes, it's, it's actually a winning on the table, uh, uh, winning elections without participate, without competing uh, in an election. Uh, so it comes in a different forms. It comes in a, in a, in a forms of uh, make sure that as many uh, many, many, many uh, opposition candidates are disqualified uh, in election, uh, or uh, many of the opposition uh, voters are not registered. We have seen uh, almost 30,000 or more than 30,000 uh, people in Zanzibar haven't been uh, registered or have been denied on their rights to register. Uh, in, in, as I'm speaking now, more than uh, Hundreds uh, opposition candidates have been uh, have been uh, have been uh, disqualified, and uh, when you hear uh, remarks from the ruling party leaders that uh, we recently hear from uh, from uh, from the speaker of the Tanzanian Parliament, uh, Honorable Job Ndugai, uh, saying that uh, he, as a speaker, would like not on to see not only uh, quality of the parliamentarians in the parliament, but to see uh, the ruling party has at least uh, uh, two thirds of all parliamentarians, so that uh, the 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 ruling party can pass whatever it wants, or the government can pass whatever it wants. So you hear this from the speaker, who is supposed actually to be on the check and balance uh, to check the gov the executive but it's actually creating an environment where the government would pass whatever it wants, not, not about checking what the government is bringing to the, to the parliament. Uh, so for us uh, who are in Zanzibar, this means, means something different. Uh, it means, it, 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 the interpretation of it is that the ruling party is preparing to change the constitution because by uh, the setup of the Tanzanian constitution, and I'm talking of the URT constitution, United Republic, you cannot change the constitution if you don't have uh, two thirds of, of the Zanzibar parliamentarians and the two thirds of uh, Tanganyika parliamentarians. So look, look, it's look, the first uh, Five more minutes, try okay. to wrap up, yes, thank you. Okay. So, so all these, all these are, are, are issues that uh, bring concerns uh, uh, to the status of, or, uh, of a democracy uh, in Tanzania, a multi-party democracy, the future of multi-party democracy. If, uh, if there's every mechanism of make sure that, making sure that the, the oppositions are, are, are not participating uh, the concern is uh, we are heading to to the single party, uh, but but there are hopes. There are hopes uh, in the same line. The hopes uh, are that uh, there's a, a a big deal of a young generation who 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 have shown interest in participating in country's politics, and uh, and this gives hopes that. Uh, young generation, young, young people are now taking a stage uh, in reforming the country's politics and all that. This, 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 this gives hopes, in my opinion, this gives hope uh, that uh, instead of a young generation sitting back and just to look at what uh, is going on, they are actually, we've seen a number of uh, young uh, candidates in this election uh, who have been actively participating in the, or contesting for positions. So it gives hopes uh, that uh, uh, there will be a, a reforms and, uh, 
and the, 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 the voice about the needs to reforms and the needs to have a constitutions hasn't uh, been, uh, and, and the reforms and the electoral management has not stopped. So in, in, in the last years, this has been a taboo talking about, about the constitutions, talk about new constitutions, talk about uh, reforms in the election, in an electoral body, but uh, this has been a, a, a talk of the town, a talk of the day every time. And then uh, it gives hopes that uh, we have, a, we have a, the multi-party democracy will stay and, uh, and, uh, and uh, it's not easy to take it away. Uh, if I can pause that, Barak. Thank you. Thank you, Omar Said uh, Shaban for your very useful thoughts. The picture that uh, we keep seeing is one of uh, a false dawn, false dawn in Africa, in East Africa. Uh, some um, Zungu wrote a book some time back, which he titled A False Start in Africa. And uh, do we seem so many years after independence to be still having uh, numerous uh, false starts? For all the panelists, the ones who have talked and the ones who will uh, come, I'd like to invite you to put this in the parking lot and maybe reflect about it uh, uh, when the plenary session uh, comes into being. Uh, how useful is it and uh, what kinds of hopes can we have if we are going to organize the institution of government around an entity that uh, seems to have stolen an election or seems to be determined to lock out uh, the democratic process. If the democratic process begins with voting and uh, the powers of the day ensure that uh, that process is itself not democratic, how much democracy should we expect in the institution of government organized around that kind of uh, entity. That is for the parking lot. Uh, but uh, while uh, at that, and looking at uh, the whole notion of political pluralism, the thriving of uh, numerous ideas, in Uganda, when uh, the Cold War was coming to an end and uh, there was this uh, flourishing of uh, voices, in Africa and elsewhere in the world, uh, President Yoweri Museveni was talking of uh, a no-party democracy. And uh, after some time, of course, he had to give way to political uh, multipartyism. We are aware, of course, that uh, the situation has uh, continued uh, to mutate from uh, one false dawn and one false hope to the other. Uganda goes to elections in January next year, which is just a couple of months away. We want to attempt to appreciate this in the context of the discussion so far, in the context of uh, hopes and impediments in the new age of uh, multi-party democracy. And allow me, ladies and gentlemen, at this point, to invite Jacqueline Asimwe to respond to the various thoughts that we have had so far, as well as share with us her own thoughts. Uh, Jacqueline, I'll give you 10 minutes, uh, plus or minus, uh, okay. two or minutes, and uh, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Barry. I had actually been calling David so that I can share uh, my screen. But, but um, if that can't happen, that is fine. I just had um, a few cartoons. Oh, you've asked me to start my video. Okay. Um, my, my, it's about to rain in Kampala. So the, the uh, connection is a bit jumpy if, and it's more stable if I don't put on my video. Is that okay? Do try, if we can see it, uh, then so much the better, but if it can't, then uh, carry on cogitate. 
Okay, so it says I can share my screen. Ah, mm -hmm. let me try and see if I can. <clears throat> yes, there's the tab called share content. Yeah, there you are. We can okay. see you. Okay, so um, let me just do, no. Oh, yeah. Okay, so don't mind the title. That is not what I'm going to present on. I had presented on that a bit earlier at another gathering, but um, oh, yeah. the main points that I want to make will, will, will come later. Um, what's, many thoughts and they, and they are jumbled for now. Um, if I can, you know, sometimes as Ugandans, we used to feel like the poor relatives in the East Africa community um, because we, you know, have experienced all manner of coups. We were under military uh, dictatorship. We, you know, we, we, Dr. William Mutunga referenced our pigeonhole constitution. Uh, so we, we, I think we looked like the turbulence in, in the sea of calm, where even though Kenya for a long time was under uh, one party, you know, Kenya was growing economically and seemed stable for a time. And Tanzania, even though it was also generally under one party, CCM, it seemed stable. You know, there was a, a, a consistent handing over of power. And then in Uganda, it was just this, this general pot of confusion. And it's not even to say that fast forward to today, we are celebrating that we are all in this confusion. Of course not. But I'm saying that that's, that's where we are coming from. We're like that limping... Uh, relative that, that joins the party late somehow. Um, and we've had, of course, our own struggles, even with the very notion of political parties. Um, and I think all across Africa, uh, you know, we came from a, a process and a, and a time where coups aided by the uh, Cold War era, where coups upon coups were the norm, and then into what became sort of quasi, um, not quasi, which became one party rulership into now more generally accepted multi-party politics. Although again, how it's determined per country, I think is very rooted in its history. And for those that know Uganda, of course, you know that we've had a very troubled relationship with what we call political parties. Um, in just after independence, the political parties seem to be aligned by ethnicity as well as by religion. And there were a lot of killings, even within communities, the villages that uh, Dr. Willie references, there were killings in those villages if you were the opposition in, in, in the dominant, you know, where, where one party was dominant and you were the minority, there was a lot of infighting there. Then, of course, when um, President Museveni took over, he told us that one of our problems as Uganda was precisely political parties, because in his view, they were divisive. And so he then required us all to be part of a movement system. He didn't want to call it a party system. And I think to some extent, and, and that is what I struggle with, to some extent, I think we didn't allow this experiment enough development. What I mean is, I think we've always imbibed, always assumed that multi-party politics is the way for our African states. I think colonialism disrupted what could have developed within and on our African continent in terms of our own ways of self-governance and self-rule. And so when um, a political leader emerges and says, no, I want to do it this way, he then succumbs to the pressures of capitalism, of trade, of, and all these other, you know, of, of, of just foreign influence and, and interference where, you know, it, they are forced to go to follow a system which they really don't believe in and I think that's what we see today. They really don't believe in it, but knowing that they rely on money um, and on support of these foreign powers, you sort of have to do what you're required to do, not because you want to, but because these circumstances dictate it. And so that's where we are right now. 
And even when we say what we need is not to change our constitutions, but to change our leaders, when in countries like ours, it is often said, it's not your vote that counts, but who counts your vote that counts? How does our vote count when we are not the ones that manage our electoral justice processes? And this is not because we haven't even tried. Um, I've been involved alongside my civil society colleagues in various campaigns around electoral reforms. And to date, the reforms that happen are only those that enable the current government to stay in power or to have a stronger hold on power. So when you're not the one in charge of changing the laws, when you're not the one in charge of counting the vote, what does change mean, especially if you don't want to go towards violence? Which I think Ugandans have generally restrained themselves from because we know the cost of violence. We have lived through violent, turbulent times. So we know the cost. And yet at the same time, even with a, a, a democracy, we're still faced with and confronted with violence at every turn. So what does change look like and what does change mean? And these, these cartoons just show some of the, of the impediments in our way. So for a period of time, like I said, Museveni comes on board in 1986 and, and I think for about 10 or 15 years, we are under a movement system. And then he says, okay, party is ready, get set, go, but you go according to our terms. Parties were only allowed to have offices, major party offices in Kampala and not beyond. And so parties are not able to recruit members. They are not able to do political education or conscientization. They are not able to, um, you know, so there's still a lot in the way. And, and, and I think the cartoon is very self-explanatory, right? One person has jumped the barb. Anyway, he sets the rules. And then all these others try to run the race, but they are all tied either to the law or to the violence that happens when they try to freely participate or participate in what is supposed to be a free political atmosphere. And you see that the reforms, like I said, are literally kicked by the wayside. I think across the East African uh, community, we all know about Bobby Wine. So maybe he now represents the new change. And I think we've had those waves, right? Um, first it was Besije, then it was TDA in the last elections. That's the, um, the Democratic Alliance. And now it is Bobby Wine. And so it's like every other day there is a wave. But that wave is also confronted with a system and an institution, a political power that has been ruling since for 35 years now. And that power comes with tricks of the trade. So you see that one of the one of the chess pieces is in the pockets. There's the gun, and I told you violence has always been and you know part of how we organize in Uganda. So that's what we are facing right now. So what does change look like when you're faced with tricks or violence or both? Then within the ruling party itself, um, when the same person hands over to himself, who hands over to himself, who hands over to himself? Um, I think for all intents and purposes, we know that in the NRM, really no one can ever stand against or even beat Museveni in, a, in, a, in the race for um, flag bearer of his own political party. And I think for many of our, no, not for many, I mean, th that's, that is our reality in Uganda. So for as long as President Museveni is the chairman of the NRM, the National Resistance Movement, we're not about to see change. So what does change look like? Or what does, what does hope look like for a political party um, dispensation? On the other side, um, the opposition has tried, failed but has tried to unite. But you can see while 
on the face of it, maybe what the camera sees, what the people see is an attempt at coming together, which is the perception part. The reality is that there are infights. And um, again, it is what it is, but we don't discount the fact that part of those infights are also informed by the context within which they are trying to unite, trying to unite where the, the rules are set up against them, where the police will not allow them to hold political rallies, where they're not allowed to recruit, um, and where even when they try to come together, there are disruptions of all kinds. So th this, these were just to share what are some of our current realities in Uganda. Money, I think across our three East African countries, elections are getting more and more expensive. And I think money taints our politics, taints our attempts at multi-party politics. Because for now we are swayed to where the money is. And usually the money is tied to the ruling party, which is tied to the national coffers. It is what it is. What does it look like to generate independent parties where the majority of your people are poor, where they are, for all intents and purposes, if we believe the, the, the poverty indices, living on below a dollar a day, where in more developed democracies, political parties are funded by their members. But where in Uganda, and probably across East Africa, a person goes to the party to get money, not to give money. So what does that, or how does that affect and impact multi-party politics in our countries? That just simply explains again what I've said, the ruling parties usually have access to the coffers. And, and Barry, you asked, you know, how do we entrust those that steal elections to manage our countries. It's literally like trying to give a fox um, to watch over your chicken house. You, you almost certainly know what is going to happen. And I am about to end. I think until we can build trust, and what does building trust look like? Until we can build trust in our systems for change, I think that change will be hard to come by. I think of our colleagues in Zimbabwe and what they are facing now. I guess there was hope that when the late Mugabe went, that probably that was a new dawn. But while it might be easier to get rid of a Mugabe, getting rid of Mugabeism is the harder struggle. And I think that will be our struggle in Uganda getting rid of a Museveni, even if through a ballot, might be the easier part. But getting rid of a system that is so tied to the way we have done politics, that is the harder part. And for now, I rest my case. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Jacqueline. And I've uh, particularly enjoyed uh, those very incisive uh, cartoons. They capture and tell our story Unfortunately, and I'm not a, a sadist uh, to be enjoying uh, the kind of reality that is reflected uh, in uh, those uh, cartoons. They, however, do capture and tell our story very quickly in a very condensed uh, manner. Regrettably, it's a gloomy story. We've had all these false dawns that do not uh, convert into mornings of uh, fulfillment. Uh, we have talked about um, the same party being in power for so long, the same individual succeeding himself time and again. Uh, but uh, significantly, you have talked about a system, a system that uh, seems to also go into different uh, camouflages in Kenya, we were told some years back that Kanu would rule for a hundred years before any other party rules. We do not know whether that is the reality or not. 
at every election since uh, 1997, we seem to have a new party. 97, Kanwan, 2002, there was something called NAC. 2007, there was PNU. Then we had uh, TNA and URP. Then we had Jubilee Party. We don't know what is going to be there in uh, 2022. I think the architects of our politics are working on that. And uh, very significantly, you have also challenged us to reflect about the possibility that we could bring about uh, fundamental change. Yoerim Seveni, when he took over in Uganda in 1986, he told the world that uh, previously Uganda had had changes of guard, but that now onwards there was going to be a fundamental change. And perhaps we have seen that fundamental change only to the extent, largely for that matter, that uh, the same person has stayed in power for long. As uh, Jacqueline says, Uganda was used to turbulence and uh, there would be a change of uh, guard almost uh, even three, four times in the same year. But uh, Mze Yoeri Museven, when he took over, he was a young Turk. Now he's a uh, Mze. Uh, how do we hope that uh, we could uh, see someday a fundamental change that is non-violent and uh, finally is it also hopeless? Could there be some light at the end of the tunnel? Let me hand over to Maurice Makolo to continue to assist us with the thoughts. Maurice, over to you. Thank you so much, Barak. I salute my fellow panelists for their very troubling, but also very sobering. Uh, thoughts that have been shared. When Wanyama started by sharing the video and then followed by Willie, it made me uh, reflect on this issue uh, that uh, Barack also raises about false dawns and false starts by remembering that famous play, Betrayal in the City, where a gentleman called Mosese Watonga is having a conversation in the prisons with a guard and he says, it was better while we waited. Now we look, we have nothing to look forward to. Now, I hope when I'm done, uh, Barak, uh, I could uh, suggest that it is not all false dawn because I want to share my thoughts wearing two hats. One, as a citizen of East Africa that has been active in the region at different levels and platforms, but also as the current uh, head of a major partner of the people and governments of East Africa uh, since 1962. Mm. The office that I currently head, uh, for those who do not know, having replaced uh, Dr. Willie Mutunga, was opened in 1962 and therefore has been here in many ways, I would say, as a, a front row witness uh, to the progress in democratic practice since then to date. I believe it would be right to say that we have been witnesses to the gains and pains of this, re of this region. We've seen progress made, but we can also speak to a lot more that still needs uh, to be done. Talking about progress made as an investor in this region, investing in uh, strengthening democratic practice, there are three macro trends that we have observed in the last few years that for me speak to this issue of hopes and impediments in the new era of multi-party practice. One is what we can call the inequality paradox. It is true that in many ways, East Africa has grown, whether it is in terms of population or in terms of just economic progress. What is also true, but and equally troubling, is that the gap between those who have 
and those who do not have is also growing or has grown. And that is what we can call as the inequality paradox. The other major macro trend that impacts our conversation today is what we could call the democracy quandary, where we, for example, talk about predictable elections. We, we, we now know, for example, Tanzania will have elections this October, Uganda will have elections next year, and we can say Kenya, and we can go through that cycle. But somehow, that aspect of democratic practice is not delivering the goods. There's something that is still missing. And I think that is a macro trend that we must continue to observe. Uh, it is not just in East Africa, but we will restrict our conversation to East Africa. And the third macro trend that one can talk about is technology as a disruptor. And when we talk about technology as a disruptor, we are talking about both the positives and the negatives. In many ways, because of the growth in a technology, we are actually able to have this conversation today, each one of us sitting in different spaces and be able to actually include as many voices as we can. But we also know that technology is also causing major shifts in how people experience work, job losses that are associated with that, but also the dignity that comes with people working. So there are those different things. And therefore, how people even vote and those votes get counted and all these different things as part of the democracy, I mean, technology as a disruptor. Having really said that, I want to talk about, on the one hand, uh, progress and hopes, and then finish with a bit of the part that's still the way that we may need to go, which could be the impediments. For me, uh, there is progress and hope in a stronger, robust civil society, despite the ebbs and flows over the years. When I talk about, uh, you know, like why there's progress, many of us will remember that many governments have almost had an anathemic reaction to the idea of civil society. But lately, we have governments themselves talking in terms of their partnership, the reaching out and the recognition, therefore, that civil society is a worthy and necessary partner of governments and people. And I think that's progress because it then begins to make us have a conversation and reasoning together as a family. I think that's something that we need to still work on. For sure, civil society has itself had its own internal uh, challenges. It has had moments of strength and moments of weakness. And even as we speak now, I think there is a major uh, retooling and reorganizing of civil society, whether through the social movements or the social justice centers or any other description of civil society. And I think that's a good thing. Number two is uh, what I would call a stronger and fairly, uh, fairly stronger public or democratic institutions. Across all the three uh, East African countries of Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, we can say that to a degree, despite very strong pressures from the executive, from the legislature, and from other kinds of stakeholders, judiciary still continue to to kind of have their feet. They may not be entirely as strong as we want them to be, but where it matters, we have had, they could be episodic, but even in Tanzania as we speak now, one of the biggest hopes for the people of Tanzania is the judiciary of that country. Even at the East African level, the East African Court of Justice remains a very strong partner, especially where the domestic judiciaries have a, a, a lot um, more intense pressure upon themselves. So there may be works in progress, but I think that we still have fairly uh, strong institutions that we can build on, and I think we should do so. The media, despite many challenges, whether it is in terms of the ownership that determines, uh, I mean, is actually responsible for some of its weaknesses, it still remains one of the trusted institutions 
that is helping countries navigate through many turbulent times. Number three, for me as progress, is the youthful population. And I think Omar also talked about placing his hopes on the young people, I do too. And I will uh, tell a story. Uh, on Easter Monday, 2018, I took my uh, family for lunch at one of these places uh, in Nairobi, and then decided to take a walk with my then 12-year-old son. And I then asked him, son, what do you like about the things that I do? And he told me, daddy, I like so many things that you do, but I will find my own ways of doing them. Now, that was just a small voice, but what that boy was telling me that as young people of this region, they are just as committed to doing things that could change this region, but they, that they want to do it in their own way. And that maybe what they need from the other folks, the older ones, is to give them the space and the trust. Jackie has ended with that uh, you know, word capture, trust. And maybe the trust that even if they failed, they have at least tried. And I think that is also something that we owe them. But I certainly will cast my lot uh, with the young people as a hope uh, for this region. Number four, local governments. I think we have had quite a lot said about the national governments. But what I'm continuing to experience is to different degrees, there are many local governments that are actually beginning to demonstrate different aspects of democratic practice whether it is public participation, whether it is different aspects of accountability, we are beginning to see this. And so you can see uh, in Kenya, we have some counties that are actually beginning to be labs of democracy, where a few things can be lifted, you know, to be uh, experiments at the national level. And I, for me, I would say that is progress and that's a hope uh, for, for the future. Number five, I earlier on talked about I mean, technology as a disruptor. I actually think that this is also a hope because giving the, ex I mean, listening to Omar and of course, since I uh, support work across the region, there's a sense in which there's a switching of, of lights in Tanzania. Different media houses uh, being shut down different civil society organizations being closed. And so one could say that lights in Tanzania are being figuratively switched off. The beauty with technology and where there is hope is that you could erect lighting infrastructure outside of Tanzania and still beam into Tanzania with the effect that there is no country that can ever be so totally closed as not to be uh, kept accountable or held uh, to some degree of, um, of light. And I think that's a hope too, uh, you know, for this region. Number five, before I do give two or three uh, things to work on, is just uh, what Willie also talked about, the political economy of knowledge production. You know, when he talked about the books by Yashpal Gai, uh, Tundu Lisu and others, for a long time, when we reflected on things about this region, it was about some guy from outside of East Africa reflecting on our affairs. But I think right now there's quite a good body of knowledge about this region that is a lot more nuanced because it is much more autochthonous. And so I want to say that progress is also in that respect, that we can have knowledge that is locally uh, produced. And I think it was just about two days ago that uh, in a different celebration, uh, Professor Issa Shivji was talking about the community of intellectuals across borders. So for me, Barak, there is progress and hope. But I also say that there's still some work to be done. And I want to point about two or three of them very quickly. One is on the inclusion. I think inclusion still remains a work in progress. One is to just even, sorry. Maurice. Maurice. Yes, Barak. Barak, I'm hearing you. Please go ahead. Yeah. 
you hear me? Uh, now I can hear you. I'd lost you. Maurice. You, yeah, I'm back. I'm requesting how many more minutes do you think you need before uh, three, we three, three minutes and up three minutes. I said, three. Did you you get three, yes, three minutes. That's okay. Okay, so just talking about the where some work still needs to be done, one is inclusion. And I was giving the example of our panel. Uh, you know, no criticism, but the fact that we only have Jackie amongst many of us is significant because it tells us about the gender agenda that we still need to work on, or people with disabilities, you know, and how we can include uh, people into these kinds of conversations. But I actually want to say that there's progress there too. Last December I was at home and there was some water project that the village uh, was uh, discussing. And specifically, somebody said, we need a lady there so that we can be compliant with the constitution in terms of uh, the two thirds. So there's a spirit about that, but there's still some work that needs to be done. The second place that is a threat in my view, an impediment is cynicism. I think there's some level of cynicism um, either amongst broken electorate, people who have been faithfully participating in election and now think, what is it worth for? You know, like we keep going through this, it's like, uh, you know, just a rocking chair, keeps us busy but taking us nowhere. And so constantly saying, I'm not going to vote, I'm not going to vote, and therefore self-censuring in that sense. But I also see cynicism among young people. Yes, they are active, but there are also a fairly good number of young people that are kind of are cynical about politics. And so that thing is also a bit of an impediment that we need to work on. Last but not least is what I would call incomplete recording of history, or maybe even downright rewriting of history. Uh, you know, when President Dan Moy rested uh, some time ago, gosh, you'd have thought that the guy was a saint because the way uh, praises were sung of the former president, uh, we seem to have forgotten momentarily about the uh, here, certain aspects of his 24 year old rule. And I also think that we tend to overplay contributions of some people in our democratic practice and simultaneously underplay or even ignore the roles of others. So I think that uh, incomplete recording or downright, downright rewriting could also be an impediment because then if we do not know where we are coming from, we might not truly go where we need to go. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maurice. Uh, that is a, a treasure trove of uh, thoughts and uh, ideas from historical revisionism to cynicism to gender exclusion to compromised uh, electoral processes and institutions. Uh, but uh, in all this, do we see some hope? Remember, we have talked about hopes and impediments. As I come to the plenary, to the raised hands, I want us to see whether we can find some spaces for hope. Maurice has already indicated, of course, that uh, if we have uh, a robust uh, civil society, that uh, would be of uh, help. But we have also seen that uh, there's a clamp down on civil society. Certainly we have seen it here in Kenya, we are seeing it in Tanzania, and uh, needless to say in Uganda as well, if, to say nothing about going further afield in the Eastern Africa region and beyond. And uh, we heard it uh, from um, both uh, Morris and uh, Jacqueline where elections become rituals and it's uh, the ritualistic nature of these uh, elections where you know that so and so is already going to win we saw a candidate who had already gone past the bar already running with the victor's flag they had not reached the finishing line but uh, they were already carrying 
the flag saying that uh, they were winners. What and where does hope lie? Or shall we continue in these uh, endless uh, circles, going round and round circles? I want to open the forum as I thank the panelists. And uh, two hands I can see are raised. Uh, Wanyama, you can come in at uh, this point. Already you have made uh, some contribution by way of the tape, the clip that we looked at, uh, but I've seen your hand coming up time and again. So Wanyama Wachebsiri, over to you. Perhaps Wanyama's hand was not properly raised. Kalu Kalumia. Kalu Kalumia, are you there? A technical team, if you could uh, please give Kalu Kalumia access. Ochen. Ochen, I can't hear you. Ochen. Could you please unmute your microphone, Ochen, if you can hear it? I think that is Honorable David Ochen, a member of parliament. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, sorry, uh, who is that who is asking if I can hear them? I'm sure now you can hear me. Hello, Kalumia. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you, uh, Chen David. Proceed, please. Yes, um, David. Thank, you. thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Thanks very much to our wonderful presenters. My name is Kalu Kalumia. I'm from a hero from Uganda. Needless to say, very proud of our of our young presenter who gives me hope indeed in the younger generation. I think Jacqueline has done us proud. But I also wish to pay compliments to the other presenters and especially excuse me to call you Willy, Willy Mutunga, a former colleague, and many other things uh, at the University of Nairobi in the early 70s. To get and my Dar question- Salam. And Dar es Salaam as well. To Dar es Salaam, of course, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where Shivji and all those other illustrious sons of Africa were. The, my question indeed has been, I think, answered by a few of the presenters. Uh, the question was, which I sort of was preempting, I think, uh, these wonderful presentations, but the men, going back to the traffickers, what we have labeled as traffickers controlling uh, our states uh, who are still very much in control of all the levers of power. I was saying, well, how do we, how do we with our youth, with our other assets, how do we turn the tables against these money lenders, these traffickers and liberate the temple? <laughs> So it is, it is a question I know which uh, is probably a generational one. <laughs> We've been through these ups and downs of exuberant optimism and pure okay, depression. Keep, keep it, keep it uh, brief. Uh, yes, yeah, so that was really my, que that was really my question. And I think uh, there has been some attempt to, to address some aspects of that question. Very good. I think the panelists have had a you loud. And I'll move on to 
uh, Ocheng David before I come to Justice uh, Wabiyabo. Ocheng? Thank you so much, uh, Barack. I hope I can be heard. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Proceed. I want to thank the uh, panelists from Chief Justice through Jackie uh, Makolo and was it Zain or somebody for their very insightful comments on the topic of the day. Omar Shaban. Yeah, Omar Shaban, yes. Omar Shaban, yeah. Thanks so much from Zanzibar. And uh, I just wanted to weigh in on one or two things, especially uh, on the issue of, uh, you know, democracy should be that it looks like in East Africa now, democracy is defined by an outgoing president being able to hand over power. Yeah, that, it shouldn't matter how this person gets to power, but once he gets in there, he doesn't leave until his term is over. There is no possibility of beating a sitting president in East Africa in an election, a quick and fair election. I mean, in the last 10 years alone, we've seen good luck Jonathan in Nigeria losing an election. We saw, Mah we saw Mahama lose an election after, his first, uh, after their first terms, but not in East Africa now. And, and so we are almost redefining what multipartism is and what free and fair elections are, so that Ugandans have to re resent the fact that Museveni will be replaced when he's leaving, not through an election. Uh, Rwanda, we almost lost all hopes that you know, Kagame would resign. In Kenya now, in three elections, uh, or three cycles of uh, over three decades now, we are resigned to the fact that a person elected will always do two terms because of something that is creeping into our, our elections called the deep state in Kenya now. But the idea that a sitting president is invincible, that they can't be beaten. So in Tanzania now, it's, it's always being sold as a fiat, a fiat accomplice that no one can beat Magufuli. In Uganda, in the general elections, it's almost being sold as given that nobody can beat Museveni. And people are supposed to believe that that is the position on that, so, so, so that another result is not contemplated and another result is not considered. So I wanted to hear the panelists on, on what they think we should do one, to change the mindsets, because it seems that it's being sold to us that once in power is not possible until you are living on your own terms or until you finish your two, your two terms. Number two is where we are stuck with dominant one party, uh, 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 what I may say, ruling parties, like in Tanzania now, CCM has been there since independence, Uganda since 86 NRM. Where we are stuck with those kind of systems, we must try to ensure that we are able to build internal party democracy so that ideas can, new ideas can be brought into these parties if there are people in those parties who would not see the, change, the, the changes of the times, we able to deal with it. Because you've seen in South Africa, again, in the last 10 years, they've been able to get two presidents off we saw Mbeki being handed out of office, then recently saw Zuma leaving office, not based on anything that is constitutional, but based on how the internal party structures work. So I would imagine that for CCM, for NRM, and, and for such kind of parties, and maybe also in, in, in Rwanda, you want to invest more in talking to the members of these dominant parties. How do you develop and ensure that these parties have internal democracy. In Kenya here in 2002, Kano had been ruling for so long and it took courage by members of that same party, Kano, to bolt out of the party when the president at that time tried to endorse a person that they thought wasn't ready, ready to be president. And so if you're able to build internal party democracy uh, in these dominant parties, then probably uh, we may go far. Number three is preparing young people to lead preparing young people to take the levers of leadership, not just in the countries, but also in these parties. I sympathize my friend in Uganda, Bobby Wine, trying to you know, create space for young people in that country. Amidst all this you know, clamping down in Uganda, in Tanzania, 
my friend Zito Kabwe is trying, you've seen Tundu Lisu, trying to create space in this, uh, in, 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 this, in this country's politics, but they lack support most of the time. With the influence, like uh, Jackie said, the influence of money, mostly government money, the young person running for president or trying to create space for himself in these environments becomes really handicapped. So how do we ensure that these young people are also resourced to be able to get their ways, uh, ways, ways through? And, and finally, I had so many things to say, but I want to finish by also posing a, you know, a question about, you know, in the 80s and early 90s, if there was COVID, most presidents would have postponed elections. They won't have gone on the elections like you saw happening in Burundi, like it's now happening in Tanzania, it's going to happen in Uganda. They would have used that as a reason to postpone elections. But they are now found, they have now found <laughs> a very important tool to, on the one hand, clamp down on their opponents by saying you can't do meetings, you can't do these kind of things because of COVID, but the government or the ruling party keeps on doing the things that they're saying they can do a case in point is in Uganda, where recently last month I saw the Minister for Health holding a huge rally uh, in, in, in her constituency. And on the same day, they were clapping down on opposition leaders in other you know, parts of the country where the, the, the person in the opposition had people in this meeting having masks. And they had to, you know, they have stopped Bobby Wine from addressing uh, radio, from going to radio stations severally now in the last one month alone. So, how do we deal with this condition where now they're using these misfortunes, <laughs> not for own elections, but to do them, but in a manner that interferes with the free will of the free will of the people. And finally for Tanzania, I was in Tanzania in the last election, 2015, as an observer. And what caught my mind most was the fact that you can't challenge the results as announced. Once the, the election commission there announced the results for the president, that's it. There's no place to challenge it, you can't go to court. And you know, how do we deal with it uh, from the panelist's point of view to, en to ensure that in Tanzania, there's also a recourse. And I'm saying this because of what we saw in Kenya in 2017, where the judiciary was able, uh, you know, like David, the, the you same happened in Malawi. Yeah, so I will stop from there. I'm stop from there, Barack, and thank you so much for the opportunity. He Yes, thank you very much. And I think at uh, some point I will want to come back to you uh, for the benefit of those who do not know uh, David Ocheng. I believe this David Ocheng is a member of uh, parliament and uh, who has uh, had to overcome major hurdles to win in uh, a constituency where there is a dominant uh, big party so that uh, you share with us a, a, a bit of uh, your experience and how it can be done. Uh, so far, we seem to be all unhappy about the state of the art, and uh, we are diagnosing the problem uh, quite uh, appropriately. But what uh, we are not seeing uh, the spaces that we want to grope for. What is the way out of this place? We may be in a dungeon, but we must look for a some window of opportunity that will get us out of this dungeon um, that this forum here must point to a direction that we could take and get where we want to go. I tell A56. Oh, Barak, you're Barak. leaving me out. You had chosen me earlier. Going away. Hello, Barak. You had. Uh... Oh, okay. Is that justice? Justice will be able. Justice will be able. Proceed, please, if you are hearing me. Justice thank will you. be able. Carry thank, on. thank you very much, sir. Um, and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, I, I want to take the chance to to thank the organizers for the panelists that have uh, made presentations. They are erudite. I have a very small question and. Um, I would like it to go to our former Chief Justice, uh, Justice William Tunga. Uh, he gave a very good example of uh, the village democracy and how it works. And um, um, my, my, my question is, uh, how, how, how can you reconcile what, what we are talking with real politics? 
I think uh, uh, all the presenters are agreed that um, uh, politicians are looking for power, and once they get power, they want to stick to it. And uh, I, I, my feeling is that it's really no longer an African problem, but uh, we see it in Russia. Uh, if you, if if I'm right, I, I can see the trend happening in the U.S. Obviously, in the in the Philippines, and one could even say even in Britain and other 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 so-called developed uh, uh, democracies. Um, could could Dr. William Tunga maybe tell us uh, what how were we able to deal with the traditional African strongman in our village democracy? And is it possible that uh, the way the, the gracious lady from Uganda suggested that, that probably we may have to look at our own African and, and traditional ways of dealing with these problems? Uh, so that, uh, is it possible that uh, one, if they don't listen to uh, criticisms, we could try maybe to, uh, to, to appeal to their, uh, to their good nature so that they, they lead us generously, and I put that in quotes, and uh, find uh, softer ways of actually getting rid of them? Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe uh, that's my question. Thank you very much. Uh, Barak, uh, I'm through. Uh, thank you, Justice. A bit of a technical thing there, but uh, I believe I can now be seen uh, loud and be heard clearly. Let me give this chance to Michael Aboneka. Uh, we will soon get back to the panelists, uh, but uh, let's uh, hear from Michael Aboneka. If you could uh, be as brief as Justice has been, I'd be very appreciative. Michael Aboneka. Thank you so much, Barack. And um, the, the panelists, my name is Michael Aboneka, and I'm an advocate from Uganda. And my question is, Justice uh, Emeritus talks about no need to change the constitution several times, but we need to change the leaders. And my question is, for the last 35 years or so, we've been trying to change leaders through an election, which up to now, we see as, as, as um, not something that will deliver the change that we want. And across board, across Tanzania, across Africa, uh, if you look at the African Charter on Democracy, Elections and Good Governance, very few of East African countries have ratified it. How else? Shall we get the change we desire if the election cannot deliver it? How else can we go about it? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Aboneka. There is uh, the user of uh, QITAL L56, after which I'll go back to the panelists for the first round of answers. I tell uh, 56, you have the floor. Yeah, I tell. I think we, we seem to be having uh, issues with the uh, ITEL Air 56. Wanyama uh, Wachevsiri, if you are still there, you had raised your hand and you can use this opportunity also as part of the panelists before you are, the rest of your colleagues uh, chime in. Wanyama is uh, not. Uh, able to be heard. I think we'll continue looking for Wanyama. Anyone who finds him, let us know. Um, meanwhile, let us go back to Jacqueline. You have the first bite at the cherry. 
you've had a number of concerns, both from your colleagues who spoke after you and uh, from the panel, the, the, the plenary you've heard about the deep state, you have heard about uh, the, this thing of uh, perennial uh, leadership. And if we could flip over the issue which uh, uh, David Cheng raised the other uh, strand of it is that uh, we are seeing political leaders all over the place, for example, here in Kenya, falling over one another, uh, looking for the opportunity to be anointed by the living president, the president who is on the way out. You can see that even people in the opposition who should uh, actually be positioning alternative agenda they also think that uh, they want to be good boys and good girls so that uh, the outgoing president can say, this is the one I have anointed. Should it be the person whom the president has uh, anointed or should it be what the people want? Where is the role of the citizen in deciding how government is chosen and how it is organized, we are seeing situations where the big boys, I've not seen any big girls, the big boys are sitting together and they are saying, this one is the one who will be president, this one is the one who will be deputy president, this one can be prime minister. Although they are speaking across uh, different political party lines. Let me invite uh, uh, Jacqueline, and uh, after Jacqueline, we'll go to Zanzibar and come back to Kenya, where we'll have two interventions, quick ones, Maurice Makolo and uh, CJ Emeritus. Jacqueline, over to you. Thank you, Barry. And uh, I don't have answers. I only have musings. Um, but I guess that's why this webinar is important, that we continue to put our heads together and I take Morris's points in advisement. Yes, there is hope. And that's again why I'm on this webinar that um, I know that citizens across East Africa deeply love their countries and are committed and are passionate. That's why we, you know, even when there is cynicism, we still turn up to vote. Even when there is, um, you know, we still participate in the electoral processes, the law reform processes um, for those who can they still you know align behind parties and and try they still stand for elective office so we haven't yet given up hope at the same time we must of course continually face our challenges um, head on and and make it a better day if not for ourselves for those to come after us now that said Again, if, if we come to Uganda in particular, we, you know, it is common knowledge across East Africa, we have never had a peaceful handover of elections. So David, uh, when you ask that question, th that is the frame from which we are coming. So it's not even like we haven't tried and failed, it's just been coup after coup after coup. And when it was settled in the final coup of 1986, we've never had a change. Has there been a win? We heard that in 2006, actually, um, Dr. Kiza Besije had won, but who is to tell? Again, when you are not the one that counts the votes, when every time there's an election, you encircle the electoral commission with the military, what are you saying? That the, the result that exits these gates must read a certain way. So, um, and that is not to say that, of course, he can't be defeated. And I, I said that what we are struggling with in Uganda is sans violence. And we don't want to go there because we've been there, done that, got the T-shirt, waved the flag in East Africa. It's a painful place to be. So when we are trying through electoral reform campaigns, through constitutional reforms, through, to, through election, you know, standing in elections, when we are trying to chip away at authoritarianism. How long do we hold on to hope? How long do we keep violence at bay? That is our constant struggle in Uganda. How long do we stand up to the violence that we are beaten back with when we come out to the streets as civil society, as the media, you know, and, and all these other players? So it's, it's not an easy answer. 
when we talk about look inward and build parties, you know, I think um, I, I never want to assume. It must be hard because uh, for, for all that we have seen, what is it like to try, remember I said that one, to even build parties where people don't necessarily believe in them, they're doing them because it's the pragmatic thing to do now. And maybe we've never sat as Africans, as East Africans to say, what works for Uganda? Or can we borrow some of what we used to do with some of what we do now and merge the two for our own thing? You know, when these powers loom over us constantly, and of course we can't always explain, I mean, blame the external hand and eye, but it does play a part for their own interests. So what is the way to even forge our own way forward? That addresses what Makolos talked about, about equality, about equity, about justice. What is that way? And how do we forge that way? When we talk about young people, they are definitely groomed and grown by we, the elders. So what have we shown? And what is to say that when a young person comes, they won't follow what we have done? Yes, we have hope in them, but they are also, it's literally monkey see, monkey do sometimes. And so we must also continually call to account those that are currently leading the way. I think I will, I was, you know, again, I said it's musings. I wish I had answers, I don't. It's musings, but I, at the end of the day, I still believe in us. I still believe in the power of hope. I still believe that as long as we are awake, as long as there are people still fighting, and I see many of, of the people um, who are guests today, I know they are fighting either as lawyers, as uh, civil society people, as media people, we must continue the, the fight. Is there a cost? Very definitely, very definitely. In any of our countries, the media is under pressure, the courts are under pressure, citizens are under pressure, and yet we do what we have to because democracy must win. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jackie. Keep hope alive, uh, keep uh, violence at uh, bay, and what kinds of role models are we giving the younger generations, even as we talk about uh, giving space also for youthful participation? Over to you, uh, my brother, Said Omar Shaban. You have the mic. Thank you, thank you, Barak. Uh, uh, thank uh, all the attendees, the participants, for their commentary, comments, and um, and my fellow panelists. Yeah, again, as as as, as everybody seems to admit that uh, the challenges uh, faces democracy is not national; it's across crossing our regions. And any threats to the growth uh, or of democracy uh, in one nation threaten the entire region and uh, consequentially threaten the community as well. So I think this should be the regional talk. Uh, and uh, it's if 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 uh, if one uh, nation uh, is facing. Uh, uh, the good governance challenges and the democratic challenge, uh, it's better that all stakeholders in the regions come together. And I, on this note, I'd really like to appreciate every player in the region for being concerned of what is going on in Tanzania. Because uh, when Tanzanian citizens and Tanzania as a country suffer, it, it affects. It's, and we have seen in some incidents, uh, you know, big, uh, on how uh, our 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 leadership, the, the current regimes of Tanzania, uh, affects uh, the entire region. So it it should be the the regional issue. And uh, uh, talking about hopes, yes, there are hopes, uh, as I said. And I believe that young generations in East Africa, young generation in every country, have a bigger role to play. Uh, and make sure that uh, democracy prevail and thrive uh, instead of uh, you know just leaving uh, this to 
the old guards. Uh, sorry, excuse my language, but you know, it should, everyone should have a stake. Media should play their role. Civil society should play their role. Uh, and that gives hopes uh, that uh, the, the democratic trends in our countries attract not only politicians, but it attract everyone. It attract uh, professionals, it attract everyone. And uh, that's, that should be the spirit. Thanks. Very good. Uh, thank you. I believe we are beginning to collect the balls. That uh, it's a, a regional challenge. All of us are involved. Do not imagine it is someone else's challenge. When one country coughs, the rest catch the flu. Young generations to also be orientated uh, differently so that uh, they play a more constructive role rather than uh, following wrong role models. And uh, remember that all of us are involved. Uh, in uh, East Africa and perhaps everywhere else in the world, you come across uh, persons who are apathetic, uh, who say things like, uh, I'm not involved in politics, I don't do politics, I leave politics to politicians. Uh, that is until the day that uh, they catch up uh, with you, politics catch up, have, have a way of catching up with you. Uh, over to you, Maurice uh, Makolo, you have got the microphone. Andreas Nandarenga, I have seen your hand. I will come back to you in the final round of uh, um, interventions from the plenary. But uh, meanwhile, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Barack, and truly appreciate the reflections by fellow panelists as well as uh, the rest of our East African colleagues. I think I want to add two things, and particularly the challenges from uh, my friend David. And David, when you talk about preparing young people to lead or developing internal party democracy, I think it is a combination of one, the narratives that we tell ourselves. You remember uh, when the Israelites uh, were about to cross into uh, the promised land, Moses sent some spies and some of them came and those guys are so huge. We are not going to do anything about them. They had to change the narrative about what they were capable of. David himself had to change in his perspective of the giant. And we face many giants. Those are the ones we've been talking about today to say that we actually can. So we've got to be very careful about the narrative that we tell ourselves. And I think that's the narrative that we tell ourselves personally, but also we tell other people. But the second aspect of that is to think about this struggle both as a sprint and as a marathon. There are things that we may need to achieve today, but I also think we've got to invest in the long haul, knowing that some things may not be achievable, even if we wanted, in a year's time or two years' time. And that might even include uh, having a bit of a longer term thinking of, um, you know, Jackie, if we think about Museveni, for example, maybe time has come to think about beyond the five year cycles of can we replace him next time and think a little bit more long term. Because I think uh, with the experience of Kenya after 2002, we sang everything was possible without Moi. And Moi did go, but we realized that a lot of the structure still remained. So I think there's that conversation to try and build in the long haul. Uh, lastly, really, for me, thinking about these COVID times, yeah, COVID has reminded us of the need for competent and efficient governance. Every day we have to somehow listen to what the government is saying. And we can see what they are also bungling. And yet we have to surrender and live by their terms. So, but competent governments just don't happen. So if there was ever a reminder of the need to engage, then this is the moment. And this is also when we need to listen to Nelson Mandela, when he says, and I quote, the ideals we cherish, our fondest hopes and fervent dreams may not be realized in our lifetime, but that is besides the point. The fact that in your day, you lived up to your duty 
and up to the expectations of your fellow men and I imagine women, is itself a magnificent achievement and a rewarding experience. All of us on this call are leaders. I think the challenge is to us. Changing East Africa one person at a time. Even though it's a regional issue, as my brother Omar has said, it is also, in my view, a personal issue. Thank you. It is a regional issue. It's also a personal issue. All of us and each one of us has a stake. We can change the narrative. It is uh, not necessarily a sprint. It could be a marathon, and we've got to invest into the future, address the infrastructure of uh, bad governance and of uh, dictatorship. Some years back, uh, Mwalimu uh, Willy Mutunga, CJ Emeritus, I recall you saying to me that you had given up on your generation and you hoped that my generation would make a difference. For those who do not know, uh, Dr. William Tunga was uh, our teacher at the University of Nairobi in the 1970s, early 80s. And uh, so when he talks about uh, generations in that regard, he is telling me that uh, the generation that is uh, 10, 15 years ahead of me, uh, he has uh, had given up on at that time. And then uh, he hoped that my generation would make a difference. East Africa is largely in the hands of my generation. And it does look malim, like uh, I have to echo your words and say to the younger people, I have given up on my generation. Maybe your generation will make a difference. You've heard what uh, the various uh, speakers have said after you. And uh, we are now saying we need to take a, a deep shot into the future and maybe not uh, necessarily think that uh, change will come in our own time. So we've got to say with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that uh, I may not get there with you, but I know that uh, you will get there. Your thoughts, um, are they uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I've listened to the question, the uh, questions from uh, Charles Kalukalumia, uh, just as the Wabuyabo um, uh, Council of Boneka. Um, <clears throat> and it, it seems to me that uh, when Jacqueline says that uh, she has no solution. Uh, uh, that's that's the feeling. But I, I, I believe that we we have to deal with this uh, pessimism, right? Uh, I I said that the burning issue is one of alternative <clears throat> political leadership, and I think the questions that were, were, were faced, uh, were posed were, you know, the current uh, uh, ruling groups or ruling elites have the money, uh, they control the machinery of violence, they are corrupt, they lack trust, uh, and there, there are many other viruses that they carry, you know, that's, uh, that's for sure. Um, but does it, that is, does it mean that we will stop uh, thinking of what should be done? Um, I, I, I think that when I talk about this uh, uh, alternative polit political leadership, I am talking about, uh, and we see them uh, in East Africa, people who are resisting, because I think history, teaches us that where there is oppression, domination, authoritarianism, there is always resistance. There's always resistance. And the best example I can give is the example of uh, Tundu Liso in, uh, you know, in Tanzania. <laughs> the, the, this is a guy who was shot so many times. He had undergone various operations. He's lucky that he survived. But he has gone back to fight against dictatorship in Tanzania. All right. 
Although they keep on telling him that this time they won't miss his head, all right? So, 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 so the optimism is that people are not going to allow this oppression, you know, and not do something about it. And we all know in our own countries, you know, there is resistance. It's only that sometimes you don't glorify it, all right? But it's there. It's there where people are basically saying, uh, this should not happen. And th they are aware of all these, uh, this violence, you know, uh, money and, and, and corruption. And so the, this leadership that wants to replace uh, the despots, and uh, I see those leadership within the political parties, within movements of civil society, they have to deal with that issue of what, 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 what are they going to do with this violence? What does non-violence mean? Because I think the violence we are talking about is not the people's violence. We are talking about the violence of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the ruling groups. And that's what the opposition will have to look at, transformative movements will have to discuss this issue. I think the, the takeaway point for all of us is that fundamental question because we have reached uh, some kind of a crossroads where we are saying uh, we need change, but we face this Goliath of money, violence, uh, corruption, lack of trust. How do we deal with uh, this you know, particular issue? Uh, it's, it's the opposition, the authentic opposition, the, 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 the social movements that want uh, to do is change. They are the ones who are going to sit down and basically say how they are going to deal with these issues. I have got my own ideas on uh, how that can be done, uh, but you know we we know that some of those concrete solutions should remain underground. Okay. And the people in Tanzania, in Uganda, and in Kenya, they have their own solutions. But what I'm putting out there is, uh, we have reached a stage, I think, in this discussion where we're best asking ourselves what is to be done, all right? And uh, as vague as uh, I'm sure I am, my optimism uh, is that history records that that kind of oppression is always resisted and it continues to be resisted. And the methods of ending it uh, will always, you know, will always be there. And uh, we, we, we go home and think of how within East Africa, uh, we, we, we're going to deal with this uh, particular issue. I see in the case of the youth, for example, I saw in Nairobi when Bobby Wine was here, the solidarity that you know came from you know the Kenyan youth and others uh, when they also um, uh, came up in support of the young woman in Rwanda. I think those solidarities are important, and we need, we need to look at the sites of resistance, eh? whether it's David or Cheng's uh, glorious resistance to you know to the giant in Western uh, Kenya. Those, those successes are important. They are very, 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 very important and we have to glorify them and, and, and basically have, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, lessons. And, uh, you know, those of us who are in Da will remember, and this is something that has been popularized the other day by a cartoonist called Mado. Mado, uh, you know what Museven is supposed to have said when he was in University of Dar es Salaam. And he said, uh, he wrote on the board, it's alleged that, you know, all the great leaders of the world, world are dead. You know, he mentions, you know, Lenin, uh, Marx, Lumumba, you know, Che Guevara, full stop, and then he added, I myself am not feeling well. So I just hope that now he is not feeling well. 
because that is an opportunity also to deal with these issues. Thank you. Thank you very well, uh, uh, very much, Mwalim. Um, most fundamentally is that uh, we must deal with uh, pessimism. We must know that uh, dictatorship itself uh, is embedded with the seeds of uh, resistance and resistance will uh, always be there. There's need for us to interrogate and understand uh, both violence and non-violence and uh, therefore uh, how uh, to navigate uh, the way forward. I'd uh, like uh, to just take two very quick uh, interventions from the plenary and then I'll go back to the panelists for their closing uh, remarks. And therefore, uh, David Ocheng, uh, uh, you have to share with us a little bit because you represent hope that uh, you have been able to overcome some of these uh, obstacles and uh, people are standing on the sidelines and watching and looking at uh, this little David uh, engaged in a struggle against uh, the giants. It was not just like the biblical David who was confronted with one uh, Goliath. There were many Goliaths and uh, we saw you go through the electoral process. We saw you as an election being stolen. We saw you go through the petition in the high court. We saw you go through the court of appeal, the Supreme Court, and we saw you go through the by election and eventually your way back to parliament and even in parliament we saw you being excluded from parliamentary committees but we saw you fight back what message do you give us and how do we keep hope alive and the candle burning uh, i want to thank uh, all I wouldn't want this to be about myself, so I wouldn't say much about that because that will take a, a whole day to talk about. But, but I think I want to pick up from where Molimu um, CJ has left and also where Jackie left us and where old Makolo also ended his uh, intervention. But we just need to be clear that we keep going. We keep walking ahead, not walking backwards. We need to, even if you only do one step in a year, even if you only do one step in a week, in a day, in a month, but let's keep walking forward to ensure that, you know, the move towards more democracy, the move towards opening more spaces for multipartism, the move towards ensuring that we are able to create spaces where our voices thrive, is, is not slowed down. Number two is what you just described about the uh, path we've gone through. I think it requires the right mindset. And for me, the right mindset is a mindset that says that one, we must not win the first time. And two, that we are willing, like Mokolo has said, to walk the long route. I said some time back, I think two months ago, uh, when I was celebrating a new constitution that, you know, Whenever you take shortcuts, whenever you hope you know, to have instant coffee where you're supposed to have uh, well-brewed tea, you always get shortchanged. And so we must also be willing to walk the paces. We must be willing to go through all the paces and all the motions, we must be willing to take the stairs where necessary to see our dreams come to fruition. For example, when, when I left the party I belonged to earlier uh, in 2016, I was almost certain that I could lose the elections. But that time, I think losing wasn't the issue I feared. And, and I was very well mentally prepared that if I lost the elections, I would have tried and I would have a leave to fight another day. And so all of us who are going to try to make our politics better, our elections better, I think the better mindset is to say that you must not win all the time and that losing once, twice, could also be part of walking forward. And, and so I would add that we keep you know, doing what we do, we do. And Barack, if we do it the way others do it because we want to win, or if we just get into these spaces 
and then become like them. Because this is what has happened in East Africa. Jackie talked about Museveni, 86. Even he, he says the book was, you didn't read the book, but the, the book was done by somebody else. But Museveni at that time said that the biggest problem in Africa is refusal by leaders to, to, to seed leadership when their time comes. Now he's been there for the last 34 years. He thinks now that's not a big issue anymore. That is so, if young people, or even not so young people, get into these spaces and want to do it the same way that others have done it, then we've come to the same problems. And this is the story of Rwanda. This is the story of Magufuli. When he came in, everyone was like, yeah, this is the guy. Now you can see what's happening here. So if, if we can remain true, what we believe in, if we can ensure that we have some, at least a basic level of purity of thought, basic level of theory, purity of ideas and, and purity of how we execute what we seek to do. Because if, if we get in these spaces as young persons, and then we, we, look at, we look back and we want to use the same method. And the story of Kenya for the last seven, eight years, and especially now, you know, reminds you that not so much has changed. We see our president that is really trying very hard to emulate his father. Even the way he walks, the way he talks, the way he combs his hair, he wants to go back in 1964, 65. I mean, if we have those kind of spaces and we want to do it the same old way, when we reach there, then we will not achieve much. And, and above all, Barack, I want to say that there's always something else that someone can do in life apart from politics. And so politics can be the beginning and the end. But when you are at it, when you are doing, when you are participating in it, either as a reformer or as a politician, it should make sense to you. The moment it stops making sense to you, the moment you know how to, to survive, the moment you have to make do with your situation, the moment you have to give up and say, this is the way they do it, then you leave that space for some other, somebody else to come out. Politics, and then finally, Finally, is that our politics in East Africa, for now, is not is not driven largely by any ideology, and and so if the new guys come in politics, if they could also combine what they're trying to do with being able to solve people's problems, day to day problems in their small ways, then that builds believability, that build, builds uh, security, and shows to those who are trying to change that the things you're looking for can actually be solved through uh, engaging in politics and doing it the right way. Because in East Africa, Barack, politics means a lot. Politics stands between whether you will get a meal or not, whether you will get a or not, whether you'll get aspirin or a malaria drug or not in East Africa. And so that's why I applaud all those who are working hard to ensure that our politics is done the right way. I, Take my heart off for everybody who is trying to ensure that our future as East Africa is one that has promise and one that carries everyone else along. Thank you, Barack. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. David, uh, I'll come to you, Andrea, for the last uh, intervention from the plenary. Uh, but uh, there is uh, here Neema Paul from Tanzania. And Nema Paul is asking a basic question. She's saying, if we are looking at uh, East Africa, hopes and impediments in the new age of multi-party democracy, what must journalists and the media do to fulfill their responsibility and ensure that society retains the faith in multipartyism and in government, and which I think is a very valid question, if I may add a footnote to it. Uh, sometimes the media in East Africa uh, tends to behave like uh, spectators. If you look at uh, Kenya, for example, where there's a comparative space for the media, it would look like uh, we liberated the airwaves, we liberated the print media space, uh, though, of course, we see interference by the state from time to time. But comparatively, the freedom is there. Uh, we seem to have liberated it without knowing exactly what we wanted to do with it. Uh, so that uh, many times, uh, if we are not doing showbiz, we cover 
civic affairs almost uh, as if uh, our role is to entertain. We look for that which is comical, that which is ridiculous, and that which is uh, laughable. And we behave in the media as if uh, we are not concerned. We could be very well watching uh, 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 Super League. We could, we could be watching uh, Manchester United versus uh, Arsenal. And uh, without knowing that uh, it touches on us eventually, uh, like uh, the panelists to uh, re reflect on that uh, as well when we come for your closing remarks. But uh, very quickly, Mr. Andreas Nandarenga, you have two minutes. Okay, thanks, Mr. Barry. My question goes to the CJ, and I was just asking, what could be done on uh, in the issue of sovereignty and uh, democracy? When you look at uh, the issue of, uh, let's say, sovereignty in our, in our East African region, you find that many of the states are doing things and then uh, basing their arguments on, on being sovereign state. For, in, for instance, when you look at Kenya, when they were dealing with the issue of, uh, let's say, Miguna Miguna, he, he is a Kenyan, he was born here around, but when uh, the, the, the guy, I mean, Meguna was actually calling for his rights to be around, Kenya said he's a Canadian or Canadian. So how do we deal with such issues when it comes to the issue of sovereignty and when we are fighting now for democracy, especially in East Africa? Bobby Wine was also experiencing the same issue la last year, I think, and even he was denied a uh, chance to go seek for me further medication in the US. And you see that it also infringes on his rights and other people's rights. How do we deal with the issue of sovereignty, independence of state and democracy? Thanks. Thank you very much to add on to that is the question here from uh, a Rotarian, I want to believe. Asimwe Davis Berige of uh, the Rotary Club of Nakasero Central to all panelists. In this process of democratization, what has been and continues to cause us headache is that the vehicles we use are totally customized to the individuals as opposed to institutions thus need to root for democracy centered on institutions versus individuals. And again, as a footnote, really, we see uh, here in Kenya, for example, political parties being uh, shopping baskets uh, that are owned by some specific uh, elite uh, politicians. If the politician moves uh, from uh, party A and moves to some new space, that space becomes a, a political party and a very strong one uh, within uh, certain demographics. But uh, you do not uh, find uh, parties that uh, can endure um, uh, ideological uh, onslaughts that uh, seem to be focused on some very clear agenda where they would be uh, taking us. I think. Uh, those are all the questions that I can see on my Q and A. I can't see any. No, no, there is a Raphael. Is it Raphael? Andrew. Andrew Kiramagi he says, Raphael, he was, uh, no, I think he was having a different uh, conversation on uh, village or community. Uh, democracy and how we were able to tame those who would be in positions of uh, uh, leadership so that you do not have uh, the kind of impunity that uh, you see among those in positions of leadership. Donald Dare says in historicizing the fall of the Berlin Wall and the changes that it dropped at the continental level, one could also mention the declaration of uh, Organization of African Unity in the political and socioeconomic situation in Africa and the fundamental changes taking place in the world adopted in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia in, the 19, in nine, July 1990. 
this set off a series of discussions, declarations, decisions, which culminated in the year 2000, the transition of the OAU with its regrettable policy of non-interference to the African Union with its more positive policy of non-indifference. But of course, we need to remind him that uh, the new uh, partnership uh, for African Development uh, Initiative uh, collapsed. It has not uh, worked uh, at all under uh, the African Union. Uh, those who follow some of uh, my own ruminations and musings in the papers will have seen that uh, uh, there are those of us who consider it to be an exclusive uh, club for African strongmen. And their only concern, if you look at Mali, for example, today, is that uh, one of them has been removed. It's not about democracy. When there was misrule, we did not see any one of them raising their hands to say, hey, wait a minute. Uh, Mr. Bo Baka Keita, uh, there is misrule here. But uh, let me not be the one to discuss that. Let me invite closing remarks. Uh, this time I'll start with you, Morris. Then I'll go to Zanzibar, where my brother Said uh, Omar Shaban is and uh, come to Jacqueline Asimwe in Uganda and uh, finally to the AG Emeritus, uh, uh, to, to the CJ, sorry, CJ Emeritus. More uh, thank you so much, Barak. I want to finish with the three things. One is praying that we all, whether as followers or leaders, have courage. Because as Maya Angelou would say, courage is the one thing that uh, is the one important virtue because without it, you cannot practice all the other virtues consistently. I pray that we all, myself included, have the courage that we need to make the difference in East Africa. Number two is the defiance. Because as uh, we have all witnessed from the history that we started with, you know, in the video and the uh, historization that uh, Willie gave us and in the entire conversation, many things will be thrown away, whether we be leaders or followers. Still, we must say in the words of Maya Angelou again, and still I rise. And I think that defiance is what is going to get us to where we need to be. Last but not least, to underscore uh, Willie's uh, you know, conversation about the alternative leadership, which is very, very important indeed. But I, I want to underscore this in two ways. By I think for us leaders, something called the duty to know. Uh, allow me, Barak, to make it through this way. Yesterday, I took my three sons to a tour of or a walk in the Ololua nature trails. And after visiting the waterfalls, and then we went to the cave, my 10-year-old asked me, and so what is ahead? And I said, well, I do not know. And in his small voice, he asked me, so you do not know where you are taking us? Then we are lost. And I think what he was underscoring there is, as leaders, we have a duty to know. And when Willie calls for the alternative leadership, I think the issue that we need to be talking about is what is the vision? Because maybe we have been facing these challenges because we've been effectively led by people who did not know where they were taking us. And that means that if I'm not a leader, then I have a responsibility to interrogate the vision. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Maurice, for your closing remarks. And I move us straight uh, to Said Omar Shaban. Over to you.
Ndugu Said Omar Shaban for your closing remarks. Yeah, yes, Barak, sorry, I, I was a bit, uh, uh, the, um, uh, first, my closing remarks, I thank uh, uh, ELS again uh, for availing this opportunity to us. Uh, I want to thank my fellow panelists and all attendees for their questions and uh, the response from uh, the panelists. Uh, as I said, that uh, democracy, uh, multi-party democracy is a very, very, very important ingredients in, uh, in, in the development. And uh, it's a ingredients, a very important ingredients in our development as a country and as a region and in the world. It's something that we cannot afford to miss. Uh, freedom of expressions, of starting from the media, of associations, of joining political parties and participating in the country's governance is something that important that we all need if we want to flourish and uh, and uh, to prosper in our economy uh, that's what i can say for now and i pause there thanks Back to you, Shaban, we don't seem to be getting you clearly and you are muted as i can see it was clear we got him. Hello. Anning, can I go? Shaban, are you still there? I have a challenge. Barak, we got uh, Ndugu Omar Vizuri Sana. Pengine itilafu za mitambo ni kwako. Yeah, I think it's, uh, there's a fault to, uh, on Barak's end. So probably we could have Jackie go in uh, as we wait for Barak to, to correct on his side. Jackie, you may give your closing remarks. Okay, thank you so much. My where I am as we close right now is at two levels. One, and I'll, I'll, I'll use a quote, where after all do, human, do universal human rights begin? And maybe I'll replace that with democracy. Where after all does democracy begin? In small places close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world yet they are the world of the individual person, the neighborhood where we live, in the school or college where we go, in the factory, in the farm or office where we work. Such are the places where every man, woman, and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity without discrimination. So my point here being, even as we discuss democracy at the level of nation state, I think it begins with the scaffolding, with the foundation. And the foundations are our homes, our offices, our political parties, that as we build it there, and it's a daily process, it's a minute by minute process. It's a process that takes commitment, total absolute commitment, that as we build it in those small places, we will build it at every level. The other thing that gives me hope is this very conversation and, <laughs> I hope too that we can build this movement at the East Africa level. And I think, especially as civil society, we have been there for each other. When there was unrest in Kenya and we marched as women traveled in our caravans to go and talk peace. When um, there is unrest in, in Uganda or in Tanzania or in Rwanda, when we stand for, for and with those that are resisting um, when organizations like, like Makolos continue to provide the support and assistance that is needed to bail out um, 
journalists, to support human rights defenders, that all this work together, consistently, committedly, we shall chip away at that which we don't want as we build towards that which we want. Thank you so much. can see Mr. Moloka is still not in. Probably we can have CJ Meritas also delivering his closing remarks. Sorry for usurping Mr. Moloka's role. No, that's, uh, that's fine. I, I just wanted to clarify. Uh, okay, let me uh, very quickly deal with Andrea's question of sovereignty. And, and, and basically say that uh, the argument, that argument is uh, raised by the government of Kenya was rejected by the courts. You know, the orders uh, that have been given by the courts, and I think there are 14 of them, reject soundly that argument. And what, what we have in the case of Meguna, Meguna is a case of subversion of the constitution, you know, by, by, by the government is, is, um, is, is a case of subversion of the constitution by disobeying court orders. And it takes us back to these leaderships that we are talking about that will not even, uh, you know, respect orders, uh, you, know, for, for, you know, from the courts. But the last thing I wanted to say is, uh, and we just clarify, is when I talk about, and, and Morris did, a, you know, clarified this for me when he said, uh, uh, it's the vision of the alternative leadership that also we need uh, to flag and say, what, what is it? What, what is this uh, leadership, you know, going, you know, what, what is its vision? So I would say that that leadership must have a vision of anti-dictatorship in whatever form, okay? It, it also has to be uh, anti-foreign domination, okay? Because we cannot have an alternative uh, leadership that caves in or, or is basically enslaved by foreign interests. And we know what that means from our own colonial uh, experience. It has also to be a leadership that believes in the resurrection of radical pan-Africanism. We talked about that as well, you know, aren't we, aren't we going to look at the vision of Nyerere, uh, Amika Cabral, you know, Nkrumah, uh, and Gaddafi, whatever people say about Gaddafi, that vision of an Amer African currency, okay? very, very, probably was killed by, you know, because of that, of talking about, you know, Africa unity and uh, uh, the currency. Uh, so that, that, in my view, is important because I think Moluka is the one who described the AU as a club of, I don't know what, you know, he called them, but yeah, he's a club, you can say it's a club of thieves, rapists, murderers, you know, the whole lot. The, the other thing is that it, this leadership must be able to have solutions on that, the issue I raised of commons, which is uh, land and natural resources, the, the whole issue of public goods, which I, 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 I talked about, because all those issues of commons and public goods are about the livelihoods of people, the majority of the people. And uh, the pandemic has, has shown how the current leaderships uh, don't have a solution and that they don't really love the people they, you know, they rule. Then the last one, and there are many uh, elements of this vision is obviously integrity. Because a leadership without integrity, a leadership that steals from, you know, from the uh, people, the, the a leadership that is uh, cannot guarantee peace, okay? Um, that, 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 that's, a, that's a leadership that we want to, uh, to, to get rid of. So 
in, in my view, it's a leadership that is very, very, very different from uh, what we have. It's, I know it's a, it's a difficult call, okay? But let's remember that uh, in East Africa, it took us almost 70 years to, 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 to fight for our independence. And I keep on telling young people uh, there are things that you do short term, media term, and long term, okay? But they have to be prepared for a situation where uh, they will be told these are not their countries. I mean, the Chinese with their legal colonialism, which is they're saying we are not like the British, we didn't steal your land, but when you build bridges for you, give us a collateral of uh, your port. When you build a railway, this is what we want as a collateral. So one day we, the young people might wake up and they are being told because of these national debts <laughs> that this country is not yours. And they will fight the foreign invaders. There is no doubt about it. There is no other, other, other choice. So all we, 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 we're talking about here is uh, uh, the growth of a leadership that sees these dangers and invests in the people. The African leaderships we have don't invest in the ordinary people. They divide them and uh, they, 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 they basically, it's about, it's, about, it's about them. And so let me end by basically saying that's the kind of vision that I would support myself or discussions, uh, you know, uh, around that, because I don't see Africa having any hope unless we res resurrect that radical pan-Africanism of, uh, of, of, of unity and, you know, uh, identifying African interest and negotiating uh, with the West and East on the basis of that, you know, go, you know going forward. I see, Barak, you are back. Thank you very much. I, I was, I've just finished. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, J. Meritus. Thank you, all the panelists. And uh, I apologize that uh, we disappeared for a while. Uh, we were not running away. A bit of uh, challenges uh, here and there for technical nature. I just want to thank uh, the entire panel uh, led very ably by uh, CJ Emeritus, uh, Dr. William Tunga of uh, Kenya from uh, Zanzibar. We had uh, Said Omar Shaban from uh, Uganda. We had uh, Jacqueline uh, Simwe. Thank you very much, uh, Nyebo, most uh, appreciative. And of course, uh, Maurice uh, Makolo, we have been able to lay it bare. We have seen what the challenges are, whether they pertain to apathy, whether they pertain to strongmanship, whether they pertain to money, the deep state. And of course, we also agreed that uh, there is a, a certain dominant paradigm, a paradigm that uh, seems to be laden with thoughts of it can't be done. These ones will always win. There's nothing we can do about it. We have also talked about uh, political parties that are uh, themselves uh, a kind of special purpose vehicles and the need to have political parties that are, are relevant to the needs of uh, the people. Issues of sovereignty versus democracy did uh, come up and we have seen that uh, part of the answer lies or uh, rests with the young people who must be given a different paradigm. We have agreed that uh, this uh, issue of uh, who is involved is actually all of us and so we must change the narrative to borrow from obama president obama or obama the candidate yes we can we can do something about it it is uh, not necessarily a sprint it could be a marathon regional agenda all of us must know that uh, where one country is involved all the others are involved that uh, we deal with pessimism we understand that uh, resistance is inevitable, understand uh, violence, uh, non-violence, and that uh, we make sure that uh, we are a part of it, 
and we need a clear message, a clear ideology, a clear sense of direction, a clear visionary leadership and agenda. And I do think that uh, I agree as your coordinator that uh, debates and conversations of uh, this kind represent the kind of hope that uh, Africa is looking for, East Africa is looking for. And so I thank uh, the organizers of uh, this uh, webinar um, led by the CEO of the East African Law Society, Anington Amol. We also had uh, David uh, Sigano, uh, who was uh, seated right here with me. And uh, taking the notes for us uh, was, uh, of course, uh, Ross uh, Lucalo. And I also want to appreciate the role that has been played by Wanyama Wachebusiri, who gave us the opening clip. So on my own behalf and on behalf of uh, uh, all the participants, we thank you EALS for giving us this opportunity. And we do hope that uh, yourself and your benefactors will give us more platforms of this kind. And uh, now, therefore, from me, Barak, it's uh, over to EALS, uh, Anington Amor, over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Muluka. Thank you for steering the discussion quite uh, successfully. And thanks to CJ Emeritus for finding his time out of a very busy schedule, as we know. Uh, Mr. Marco Law, again, for his support. Ford Foundation has been supporting us through the years in holding conversations around democracy, rule of law, and human rights. And we appreciate this support and the support granted to our sister organizations and like-minded bodies from the Ford Foundation. My boss, Omar, Said from Zanzibar, my former council member and former president of Zanzibar Law Society. I appreciate your participation, as well as Jackie Asimwe for coming through to join this discussion and present a perspective as she is quite an authority in the civic space, not just in Uganda, East Africa, but across the continent. And I appreciate each one of you for taking your time. We've gone beyond the time earlier stipulated, but due to the richness of the content, you've been able to stay with us. We appreciate and we look forward to inviting you again in partaking more of similar conversations. Thank you and have a good evening.